seventh um, historic preservation summit that has been um, organized by the Pinellas County Historic Preservation Board. And each of our summits is in cooperation with one of our local communities. Obviously, we're here in Tarpon Springs today. My name is John Berry. I'm a member of the board serving um, my second three-year term um, and uh, enjoy doing so. I have a career um, in, in historic preservation as a, as a preservation architect for a number of years. And so this is something that I enjoy doing. I'm going to be kind of your master of ceremonies this afternoon, so we have a couple of rules. No throwing of anything at me. Okay? <laughs> I promise... I promise not to swear, or if I do, I'll do it with flair. And the other thing is I'm going to ask all of the speakers um, to stay within striking distance of this microphone. If you look to the back of the room, um, this presentation is being videotaped by the Pinellas County um, Communications Department. We, um, as the Historic Preservation Board, are part of the larger county community of organizations. <clears throat> Each of the members is appointed by a county commissioner. As part of that, all of what we do is in the public realm, so this videotape eventually will wind up on the county website. We actually have a page there. Um, if you go to pinellascounty.org and actually type in the words historic preservation, you will go to a page that page will give you, on a daily basis, information about the activities of the Historic Preservation Board. We have uh, tape recordings of previous summits. I think we missed six, but we've got one through five. And then all the presentations that you will experience today will be there as part of the public record. What we're really trying to do, the mission of the Historic Preservation Board is one of education. Um, but as with all boards, we have a leader. So it is my pleasure to introduce our chairman and a member of the county uh, commission, Charlie Justice. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for being here. How's everybody today? I tell you, uh, it's a special treat to be here in Tarpon Springs and I had it be, before we started this uh, afternoon, a special private tour with the mayor and so if you can get a private tour with the mayor of the museum here, uh, then you're really in high cotton. So uh, it's, uh, I appreciate the opportunity, appreciate the chance to be with you today. Uh, before I open my remarks, I do want to remind you, um, we kind of, the sun is shining and we're back to summer weather, uh, but I do want to remind you that we are still dealing with the aftermath of the storm. And in that uh, vein, FEMA, uh, Disaster Survival Assistance Team, will be in Pinellas County this week uh, tomorrow, 10 to 4 in Largo, and more importantly, Friday, 10 to 4 uh, at the Tarpon Springs Shepherd Center on Pinellas Avenue. So if you or someone you know uh, needs to avail yourself of those services, uh, FEMA will be here in Pinellas County this week and uh, take advantage of the, their presence for your assistance. Uh, as John said, this is our seventh summit, and uh, uh, we've come a long way from the first one to this one. And I did want to recognize uh, one of our last ones we were... Uh, Pleased to have in the city of Oldsmar today, we're joined by the former city manager of Oldsmar, Bruce Haddock. Bruce, wonderful to see you today. The uh, seventh summit was accomplished by a lot of work by our board, specifically uh, through a true partnership. And I wanted to thank the mayor, Al Husus, our entire Tarpon City Council, our Tarpon Arts Director, Diane Wood, and all of the city staff that's worked to make it uh, possible and graciously host us today. I want to thank uh, today's presenters for being here. You're going to hear a wonderful uh, selection of presenters and topics today. Uh, and I want to specifically thank John Barry and Phyllis Kolianis from our board for all the extra work that they've put in to make it uh, happen. If you stand to be recognized, John and Phyllis. And it is a team effort for our entire Historic Preservation Board. And if you're a member of our Preservation Board, would you stand to be recognized? I see several of our members here today. I know we want to get right to our program, but I do want to say a few uh, words kind of about the evolution of our board from where it came from. Uh, in 2012, before I was elected to the commission, the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners created the Historic Preservation Board in recognition that preserving and protecting our historic resources contribute to the education, culture, economy, and quality of life for the citizens of Pinellas County. 
We were proud through our efforts of the organization of the board, some of the technical work we had to do, some of the outreach work we did. We were recognized by the National Park Service and by the state of Florida as a certified local government uh, back in 2015. This is a huge deal for a local government to be recognized as what's called a CLG. It allows us to go out and apply for grants and be recognized uh, for our efforts and recognized for our uh, professionalism and uh, it's an important designation for Pinellas County. Our board was tasked with protecting critical cultural resources through our jurisdictional authority, mainly in the unincorporated areas of Pinellas, by recommending sites for designation as historical landmarks, and by issuing certificates of appropriateness for any alterations proposed to existing landmarks. That is what makes up the bulk of our, our meeting times. Our board is also a, a countywide mission through our CLG to provide educational opportunities through events such as today's summit, and through a historical marker program that we began implementing in 2016. We have been approved by the state of Florida for five markers up to date. We've partnered with the city of Tarpon Springs to apply for a marker to be located outside of the Tarpon Springs Historical District. Today, the state's historical marker council will meet later this afternoon and they will consider our application. So hopefully by the end of our meeting today, the end of today, we will have one more marker approved by the state and one more success that we can call our own. Again, I want to thank you all for being here, joining us for this uh, seventh summit. Hopefully you enjoy it. You'll be back for our eighth. And uh, I want to thank you again for attending and those that uh, made it happen. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our mayor, Mayor Alahousis. Thank you, sir. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Historic Preservation Summit number seven. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome the uh, Historic Preservation of Pinellas County here at Harper Springs. And also I wanna thank our Historical Society for all the things that they do to help us preserve our history here in Harper Springs. Thank you to all of you. I wanna give a special thanks to uh, Pinellas County Commissioner Charlie Justice for his leadership, for his leadership not only for, uh, and, and his support to the um, historic preservation, but also for the project that was so important to us here in Tarpa Springs, the, uh, the dredging of the Eklund River. Uh, Commissioner was, help us to uh, get the $3,000 uh, funding in order to start the project, which is so important to our uh, culture and to our local economy. Yeah. Uh? 300,000. Did I say 300,000? It's just a few zeros. But, but the thing is, I want to thank you for, for helping us out and I thank you for your support. And now we're looking for the help from the state in order to get the ball site. Again, I want to welcome you to Harper Springs and it gives me a great pleasure to uh, welcome our own Diane Wood, the uh, director of our culture department. Thank you very much. Everybody. Welcome to our home. I have the unique pleasure of uh, calling the Heritage Museum also my office. You know, so I have a lot of jealous friends that, you know, I take pictures of Spring Bayou and how beautiful Craig Park is. And it's like, gee, I have to go to work today. Poor me. But, uh, no, I uh, really uh, love um, our, our department. Um, Cultural and Civic Services, part of the city of Tarpon Springs, and uh, not only do we have the Heritage Museum, which I hope you will take advantage of uh, looking around while you're here, and I understand you're going to be able to visit the Safford House Museum later um, this afternoon, so I hope you enjoy that uh, as well. We also have two performing arts centers, one over at City Hall, which has 300 seats, and we also have our cultural center where uh, we have an 85 seat theater and we also have a wonderful exhibit going on now uh, from the Smithsonian Institution called The Way We Worked. So I hope um, while you're in the area that you'll take advantage of going to see that as well over the Cultural Center. But I know you have a great agenda going on this afternoon so welcome everyone. Thank you for being here and uh, enjoy. Uh, I'm now going to bring up, I'm sorry, uh, Chris Moore.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today and everybody that took part in uh, making this a reality. Um, we want to take the opportunity to educate folks about the upcoming Penny for Pinellas uh, renewal referendum to occur on November 7th. Um, we have a short video to play for you to, to, to hit some of the highlights. Um, wanted to specifically tie it in today's event as um, you know, there's some handouts at the, at the, at the sign-in table there, speak specifically to some Tarpon Springs projects um, that would utilize penny funding and, and from a historic preservation perspective, one of those projects uh, is a, a seawall restoration and repair um, for Dodecanese Boulevard, and forgive me if I did not articulate that uh, properly, but um, so you can see uh, the importance there. Uh, the seawall would um, provide such a critical cultural heritage um, asset as, as the sponge docks there. So um, with that, just wanted to play a, a short video for you. And if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask. And also we do ask that you, um, there are additional handouts. If you want to share those with any, any neighbors, we would appreciate that as well. Thank you. From protecting our waterways to enhancing our roads, the Penny for Pinellas supports investments that matter most to our citizens. The Penny is a 1% sales tax that has been in effect since 1990. One third of Penny funds come from our visitors and tourists. The Penny funds projects without relying on your property taxes. As a sales tax, the penny is not collected on groceries or medications. On November 7, 2017, our residents will decide on the renewal of the penny for 10 years. Stay tuned for more videos that will answer your questions about the penny for Pinellas. Thanks everybody. We did our best with the audio there just to highlight a few of the key points in case anybody couldn't hear. You know, it's a 1% sales tax. It's not a new tax. This was first implemented in 1990, so this would be the fourth renewal. Um, a third of that revenue is paid for by tourists. All the money uh, that's collected in Pinellas stays in Pinellas. Um, it, it, it funds critical projects um, such as the um, seawall restoration there. Other um, you know, any other projects to improve our water quality, safety and security and preserving our parks and open space and things, things like that. Um, the revenue shared between the 24 municipalities and the county would estimate uh, bring in an, an estimated $2 billion in, in revenue to be shared between the, all of our communities uh, to fund projects like that. So again, it's November 7th, um, and if you don't mind sharing those handouts, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Don't you like it when that political stuff they say short and it actually is? Uh. I like that. <laughs> okay, we've got a great program uh, for you this afternoon. And uh, I have to say that um, I thought when I left the Army years ago that I would stop volunteering and I, I, I guess I have the gene. So um, I've been kind of the front person uh, working uh, the, probably the more visible side. Uh, with the support of all the board members and putting these things together. But the credit for what happens over the course of the next four hours has little, if anything, to do with me other than being a really good cheerleader and everything to do with our next uh, and first speaker. Uh, I want to introduce Phyllis Colianos, uh, who probably everybody in this room knows, but let me just give you a little bio really quickly. She retired from Pinellas uh, County Government in 2012. She received a master's degree from the University of South Florida in applied anthropology. Just said that, didn't I? Anthropology. Those long words get me sometimes. And is co-editor of two award-winning books on Frank Hamilton Cushing's expeditions in Florida. Uh, UPF 205, it tells me. She's a registered professional archaeologist, and she is currently active in field work in southwest Florida with the Alliance for Whedon Island Archaeological Research and Education Incorporated. So Phyllis, tell us all about Spark Tartan Springs, please.
Thank you, John. Well, Tarpon Springs has a very unique and vibrant history, and in the next few minutes, <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit and show you some photographs about uh, some of the finer details that make our community so special. <clears throat> First, I'm going to talk about the cultures, and I have to start with the Native American cultures first because of the fact that we had Native Americans actually inhabited this area for over 2,000 years. Then I'm going to go on into talking a little bit about the early pioneers that we had along the Anclote River and also about our city founders and, of course, the influx of Greeks that made our uh, community so special. Uh, ancient um, uh, settlements actually thrived on both sides of the Anclote River. And we also had them along our coastal areas, and we had them around Lake Tarpon, which was once known as Lake Butler. But there was uh, a long habitation here in Tarpon Springs. This is the person I wrote some, uh, or co-edited some books about, Frank Hamilton Cushing. And right in this photograph. He is in a cottage on the brand new Tarpon Springs Hotel. Uh, it was built in 1884, but the cottages were put there a little bit after that. And he's been excavating a mound uh, in Tarpon Springs, a burial mound, uh, back in 1895 and 1896. He was here for several months. And in this burial mound, he found pottery that ranged from 500 BC all the way up to AD 1200 and 1300. So here he is repairing a pot. So we know there's been that huge spans of time that we had habitation here in Tarpon Springs. These are some of the early settlers that were here in Tarpon Springs. Samuel, uh, Captain Samuel E. Hope. Uh, was the first private landowner along the Anclote River back in 19, 19, 1864. And he was a surveyor, so he was very familiar with this area. And in 1867, he sold land to the Myers brothers, uh, Frederick and Benjamin Myers. They were both married to a lady named Sarah. Now, the Myers brothers actually um, passed away from yellow fever a few years after they moved here. But their wives stayed on and raised their families, and we still have descendants today from the Hope and the Myers family living in this area. Uh, in 1876, A.W. Boyer come, uh, came to Tarpon Springs from South Carolina with his young uh, teenage daughter, Mary. Uh, Mary is noted for having named Tarpon Springs because she saw Tarpon swimming right out here in our bayou. And uh, I don't doubt that at all. Uh, um, in a few years after they had been here, a young man named Joshua Boyer came to Tarpon Springs in his sloop. He just sailed it right into the Spring Bayou area, and he saw how marvelous the natural habitat was, and he decided to stay. And he and Mary got married, and so this is their cottage that was just a few blocks from here, uh, the Boyer Cottage, and it was restored, and it is at Heritage Village, so you can go visit this cottage. Uh, in 1881, Hamilton Diston made his fantastic or amazing land purchase, some 4 million acres of land for only 25 cents an acre in, in Florida. And a lot of that was swamp land around the Kissimmee area, but he got some very prime property right here in Tarpon Springs. And so he wanted to develop it, and he started a Lake Butler Villa uh, Corporation to develop the property. And he uh, really, um, he brought down someone to plan the, the streets. And he also brought his good friend, Anson P.K. Safford, who uh, brought his family in 1882. Now, uh, Safford was also the ex-territorial governor of Arizona. And he um, was a, he had been appointed um, governor by 
uh, Ulysses S. Grant. So he and Diston were friends, and he started uh, the development here in town. Uh, the following year, his sister, Dr. Mary Jane Safford, followed him into town. Uh, she's known as one of the first female physicians here in Tarpon Springs and in the state of Florida, actually. So this is a picture of the Safford house years ago with the Saffords on the front porch and I believe his wife Soledad, I don't know if you can see it, she's up above on the second balcony. And this is a house you're going to get an opportunity to tour later today after our, our meeting here. With all this influx and publicity to bring uh, people into our new resort community, uh, we were able to um, also entice people that were needed here, service people. Uh, African Americans were in high demand to come to Tarpon Springs and uh, had, they had many jobs here offering um, employment such as the, the sawmills, uh, the sponge industry, and also providing many services throughout town. This is a, a, a business by one of the, the um, uh, black tarpanites here. It's at Patton's Quarters, uh, which was where the Patton Sawmills was located down near the river. And then, of course, we had the influx of Greek, a Greek population in 1905. Um, John Cheney had started the sponge industry in uh, the late 1880s, and he had hired a man named John Kukuris who uh, came to work for him, I believe, in 1896. And John knew of a better way of gathering sponges instead of the old hook and bucket method. And so he had convinced Cheney, um, and they sent for um, uh, all the immigrants from Greece that uh, were you know, sponge divers with the, the hard hat and the suit. And so about in 1905, we had some 200 Greek men arrive in Tarpon Springs, much to the concern of the town. Uh, people, <laughs> you know, okay, and so, but uh, quickly following in the years uh, were the, uh, the Greek women with their fine culture and cooking and all of that is history today. So what else do we have here in Tarpon Springs? We have wonderful places. We have beautiful waterways. We have the Anco River uh, that flows as an estuary out into the Gulf of Mexico. We have... Um, uh, lake Tarpon, which is a seven mile long lake, and we have many springs because Tarpon Springs is actually setting on a limestone bedrock. Um, then I'm talking a little bit about the other things, city planning and um, some of the other highlights. Uh, this is an early photograph of the Tarpon Springs, um, in Tarpon Springs, of the meandering Anclote River. Uh, going out to the Gulf of Mexico. And here is our lighthouse. And our lighthouse was really important because it was built in 1887. And that year there were two other things that were important that happened here. Uh, the Tarpon Springs, we had around 200 citizens here at the time. And it was incorporated into a city. Uh, the first incorporated city in the Pinellas Peninsula. And also, uh, the other important thing is in the late um, winter months in 1887, the Orange Belt Railway came into town. So we had a narrow gauge railroad that actually made it into Tarpon Springs. Prior to that time, the only way you could get here was by taking a train to Sanford, Florida, and then overland by horse and buggy to Cedar Key, and then steamboat into Tarpon. So this was great, and it brought in an uh, influx of new people into the community. And this is a photograph from the 1920s, right here on our spring bayou, right where we are today. And you can see in the foreground, um, this huge hotel down at the bottom, uh, that was the Tarpon Inn. 
And it was a, a beautiful hotel built in 1912. Uh, unfortunately, it burned in 1927. But it had all of the modern amenities that were needed to, um, thank you, <laughs> uh, to actually, you know, uh, support this, you know, really nice community that was growing here. And you can see the way it was planned. Everything was kind of planned, kind of radiated out from this Spring Bayou area. And then, of course, we had the sponge docks early in 1901 or 1902 uh, the u.s army corps of engineers finally dredged the ancloat river it was very shoal uh, we couldn't get any big vessels up into the city area but by uh, these this picture was taken um, probably in the very early 20s but uh, the sponge docks was actually established in 1908, where it is today, along with the sponge exchange. And this is a wonderful photograph of hundreds of sponge boats. And um, at the Historical Society, we have this ledger that talks about tax assessment in the year 1911. So over 100 sponge boats were assessed for taxes in town. So we, we've even got the names of them. It's really great. So let's talk a little bit about buildings, um, some of the architecture that we have here. Uh, I'm going to start with the mounds again. And I'm going to talk because uh, S.T. Walker actually uh, drew a map back in 1883 of mounds that he saw along the Ancote River. And the one mound that he saw right at the entrance of the river was the Ancloat Mound. And this is still a mound you can visit today. It's in Ancloat Park, and it has an actual ramp that goes down to the river. It was a plat, uh, platform or flat top mound. Another mound you can see is right up from Mrs. Meyer's store and uh, Mrs. Meyer's house. And that was another large mound that was here. We no longer think this mound is extant because uh, it probably was sitting on the Victor Chemical and became the Stoffer Chemical property. We do not believe it's uh, still in existence today. Other mounds he mentioned included the burial mound up near our spring area. Whoops, I'm going to go back. There we go. Some of the early frame vernacular housing, uh, of course, started with the Myers store, which we now see from the map. It was there in 1883, uh, and that's the first one at the very top. Uh, it burned down around 1890, and another store was built. Um, and you can see that in the second photograph underneath it. And this is a, a beautiful frame vernacular house. We have. We have quite a few of these uh, in Tarpon Springs. Uh, these were early built. I believe this one was built in 1885, 1889. Uh, this one is the one that uh, Ed Hoffman has his uh, Hoffman Architect building in. It's right down on Orange Street. And uh, it's a beautiful example of the frame vernacular homes that were built at that time. And then, of course, we get to the Golden Crescent. And the Golden Crescent was the area around this spring bayou that accommodated the winter cottages of the very wealthy people from the Midwest and the North that came to Tarpon Springs. Uh, this house uh, was built by Ed Knapp. I believe that was, was 1885. And it, it had a crescent motif to it. Uh, both inside and outside of the house. Another one of these homes, uh, this one was uh, Mr. Allworth's home. And many of these homes uh, exist today. They're well maintained and um, still very beautiful. And then of course we have this Victorian cottage. Uh, this was uh, George Clemson's. Uh, he was um, a very wealthy man from Minnesota in the hacksaw business. And he uh, built this uh, by bringing into town, in, on the train, uh, not only um, all of his workmen, like 70 workmen came to town to build this house for him. 
And then around the bayou, at one time, some of us remember the boathouses. Uh, Tarpon Springs had beautiful um, uh, boathouses to accommodate the uh, winter homes. And uh, unfortunately, none of these exist today, but uh, Tarpon Springs was certainly a boating community. We had not only the sponge boats and the fishing vessels, but we had all kinds of pleasure boats. Boats, um, all kinds of different vessels that they kept in these boathouses. And then, of course, the docks. I'm sure Tina will talk a lot about the sponge docks in the Greek town area with their uh, bungalows uh, throughout Greek town. And this is a picture of the early sponge exchange, and below it is the business of uh, the Cavicles coffee shop that started in 1913, is still a working business today. And then, of course, we had a revival through town. Uh, this was built in 1915, uh, our city hall, which served several purposes. It served not only as a city hall, but also for our fire department and our uh, police department. They were both on both ends. And then during the boom time in the 1920s, we had a lot of building going on. This one, I believe, was built in 1925 or 26, the Shaw Arcade. Uh, they were built uh, in the Mediterranean revival style. Uh, we also have some art deco throughout town. And uh, Tarpon Springs actually did pretty good through the 1920s. We were lucky. We had that sponge industry that was uh, still doing extremely well. So the depression didn't hit us quite as hard as it uh, did other places. And then just in case you think or doubt in any way about Tarpon being, you know, called Tarpon Springs or named Tarpon Springs. Here's a picture from the 1950s uh, with uh, some local residents with their tarpon catch. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Phyllis. Um, if you, uh, when you signed in, there is an agenda here, and we uh, uh, try to uh, maintain that schedule. Uh, Phyllis gets an A plus because she was right on time, <clears throat> and it's always a good way to start out an afternoon like this. Um, along about three o'clock, by the way, we're going to take a break, and we've got a special treat in store for you. Uh, but in the meantime, our let me introduce our next speaker. Um, <clears throat> who is Peggy uh, Prostos? Is that did I spell that? Did I pronounce that correctly, Peggy? Where are you? There you go. Okay. Um, Peggy is uh, um, was born in Tarpon Springs and uh, has gone for more years than uh, 45 years until she retired from the city of North Las Vegas in 2010. She worked as an economic development professional for 38 years in Denver, Kansas City, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas areas. Uh, when she returned to Tarpon Springs in 2011, she immediately became involved working with Tarpon Springs Area Historical Society to help preserve uh, Tarpon's history. Peggy received a Bachelor of Science in Business Management and a Master of Arts in Organizational Management from the University of Phoenix, Las Vegas. Uh, Peggy is active in the community as a member of the Rotary Club and the Women's Club, as well as other community organizations. So let me introduce Peggy, who is going to talk to you about the 50th year Tarpon Springs Area Historical Society. Now I'm really glad that I didn't bring a slideshow because it would have been almost a duplicate of what Phyllis did. So I'm really glad I didn't do it. Uh, what Phyllis didn't tell you, and some of the locals know, is that a couple of decades ago, some nasty person in Tarpon Springs started a rumor that it really wasn't a tarpon at all, it was a mullet that was springing out of the... Uh, and we have been fighting that rumor 
all these years, and sometimes you'll still read in the beacon that some people think it was a mullet, but we all know it was a tarpon. And that, that's why Phyllis showed you that last picture. Um, we're all very proud of the history of Tarpon Springs. As she showed you, there's a lot of folklore here, <clears throat> and there's a lot of, uh, we all, we're always trying to find ways to preserve and to preserve our buildings. I was particularly pleased when I came back to Tarpon because what used to be my high school is now the city hall and the performing arts building. And somebody said to me, does it bother you that they change your, your high school into city hall? And I said, oh no, I'm really glad about that because they preserved the building. What really bothers me is they changed the football field into a sewerage dump. And, 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 and that's kind of the way I feel. And, uh, we're very happy to have you here in Tarpon Springs. The Historical Society is always proud of what we do. Um, <clears throat> we, as, as was said, this is our 50th year. On March 15th, 1967, 112 men and women from Tarpon Springs signed the, the document that made us a not-for-profit organization to preserve the history of Tarpon Springs. And we've been doing that ever since. Uh, we've done it in many ways. There were several years when the depot was closed, when um, we didn't have a museum, but we always had a museum of part of it. Um, there were parts, times when the waiting room was, kept, was allowed, we were allowed to keep uh, museum relics in there. And then we were very lucky in 2005 when we were able to open again after the city got a grant of more than a million dollars and, um, and got it renovated and preserved, and we were allowed to open it. The, at the, the train depot is actually um, owned by the city of Tarpon Springs and maintained by the city of Tarpon Springs. And we're very fortunate that we have a 10-year lease, which, which, which is renewed every year. And, and we're very proud of our partnership with the city, because not only does the city help to pay the expenses and, and work very hard to maintain uh, that building, but they also provide us the money out of the redevelopment dollars so that we can have a train depot coordinator. And that helps us a lot. And as, as I'm sure many of you know, it's very difficult for nonprofit organizations to be able to sometimes fund things like that. And it's not always easy to get the volunteers that you need to keep it open. We are always struggling to find more volunteers. But during that 50 years, we've done many amazing things for such a, 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 a small organization, although we, we keep a pretty good um, membership. With our life members, we have almost 200 members. And, uh, so, and we're very proud of that. This year, because we do, did want to celebrate the 50th year, we actually started last fall um, I don't know how many of you know it, but in 1953, they made a movie called Beneath the Twelve Mile Reef. And pant my heart, I was 12 at the time, Robert Wagner starred in that movie and Gilbert Rowland. And so all of us kids were thrilled. Well, what we did was we couldn't get it this year, so we, we partnered with the library and last October, they actually show because we don't have the copyright, they actually showed the movie and then we had a reception and everybody came over to the reception at the depot and we had some of the people, including the, 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 the Staley uh, ladies who have married names now, who, t who talked about what it was like uh, because the, the actors all stayed at the Villa Plumosa when it was a hotel during that, when that movie was being made and it was a lot of fun. Um, we also, uh, have tried to celebrate all year long with different events and we will continue to celebrate until the end of the year and maybe in the next year, I don't know. Um, we had a gala, we always have a fundraiser, like many nonprofits, we're always looking to raise money each year and to make it fun so that we can make money and, um, and to keep the coffers going. And this year we called it the Golden Gala because it was our 50th year. And it was very successful, we actually had it here and it was very successful, and we're hoping to have it again next year. And, and we started off by um, subtitling it Taste and Tunes, 
is kind of something I wanted to do because I wanted us, if it was really successful, it could continue to be kind of, can call taste and tunes in the future, so that we could have local music and we and we could um, have local businesses help us. We had actually 30 company uh, restaurants, taverns, and and um, companies stores that donated all the food, all the wine, all the beer, and everything in support of the event. It was a great event. We also so that it would be remembered that this was our 50th year, we helped to write um, a, a, a mayor's proclamation. And as all of you know, you can always use proclamations to say all the things that nobody lets you say because they shut you up about how wonderful you are. And then it's all in the proclamation forever. And we, had a present, and we made a presentation at the city commission as well about it. During the years, we've participated in Christmas uh, parades. We've did reenactments. I was very happy one year when I was able to reenact Soledad myself, um, Anson Safford's wife. And um, we have, we've had historic house tours. We've had, we, you, you've seen outside and you'll see again the wonderful 1926 Chevrolet Jitney that was donated to us by another old timer Hercules Ypsilantis, and um, it had been sitting in a storage shed for 50 years. And um, we have before and after pictures. And uh, we were able to raise the money, more than $43,000, so that we could get it restored to its glory and its original colors. And now we have it, and the city again is helping us by keeping it on the city property when, we, when we're not, because we don't have a permanent place yet. Uh, to garage it. So we have spent the year trying to do other, do as many things as we can to remind people. One of the biggest things that we've done over the years is that every year, and it's in our bylaws, we, in January, we have an annual remembrance tea. And at the remembrance tea, we recognize three families. Um, a white family, a Greek family, and an African American family. And this year was our, for our 50th, we actually asked members of the families that helped to, to, be, to start the, um, the Historical Society in 1967 to participate that. We actually had four families because we included um, uh, a fourth family as well. And we do that, like I said, every January. And it's a free event where we recognize our, the people in our community. So everything that we do, that we try to do, is to, in one way or another, to support our town and our relics and, and our wonderful Jitney. And um, we're hoping that we'll be around so that we can do it again in another 50 years. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Our next speaker comes with a story. Um, we did not have a uh, summit in, in uh, May in deference to the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation, a statewide organization, um, which uh, had held its statewide conference in St. Petersburg uh, at the beginning of May, and we did not want to compete with them. We were hoping that we could encourage as many people as we could in Pinellas County to uh, attend that conference. And I was uh, leading a workshop uh, at the conference and I had a flyer out there that was announcing our summit number seven which was scheduled for October 18th. Uh, how do we do October 18th? Well our board meets the third Wednesday of every month and rather than have a board meeting we said okay well we'll just substitute. We'll we can have a board meeting if we need to before or after the conference and we'll just substitute that and have the summit at the same period of time. One of the reasons we do that, by the way, and I probably should have mentioned this right up front, is uh, the board is, an appointed board, is volunteers. We are not paid um, for the effort and the time that we commit to uh, uh, giving attention to the historic resources in Pinellas County. Um, and we don't have a budget um, other than the budget that Charlie was telling you about earlier, which where we get money from the state to do things like use or develop a marker program, some of those kinds of things that are actually um, a direct benefit to um, 
uh, identifying historic preservation in our community. So we set the um, date for October 18th, and uh, of course one of the things that one has to plan in advance is the venue. So Phyllis, being a board member, said, okay, well, we had decided on Tarpon Springs. And uh, Phyllis said, well, let me line up. I think I can get the Heritage Museum. And sure enough, we booked it for October 18th. So we publish the uh, date, and I make the announcement, and there's flyers all over the place at the conference. And at the end of my workshop, this woman comes up to me and says to me, you cannot have that conference in Tarpon Springs on that date because I won't be there, and you can't have it without me. Well, the truth is, when I found out all that I wanted to know about this lady, we discovered that, in fact, we could not have it without her. And so it was moved to today. So without further ado, let me introduce Tina Bacavales. She is the curator of the art and historical resources for the city of Tarpon Springs. Previously, she was the state folklorist and director of the Florida Folk... For <laughs> Folk Life, say that five times fast, John, the Folk Life Program, Bureau of Historic Preservation, and the Curator of Folk Life for the Historical Museum of South Florida. She is an author, editor, or co-author of five books, including Greeks in the Tarpon uh, Springs. That was published in 2016, I believe. Greek Music in America. Is that 2018 or 20, 2008? Next year it's going to be published. The Florida Folk Life Reader, uh, South Florida Folk Life, and Just Above the Water, Florida Folk Arts. In terms of historic preservation, she wrote the nomination for the Tarpon Springs Greek Town Historical District and Rose Hill Cemetery, and co-wrote the nomination of Eatonville, Florida. She also directed the Folk Art Architecture Survey while with the BHP. She holds a PhD in folklore from Indiana University and a Master of Arts in Folklore and Mythology from UCLA. Let me introduce Tina Bacavales. Thank you very much, John. I think I said should have me there. <laughs> but it's a good story. OK. Uh, in June 2014, the National Park Service added the Tarpon Springs Greek Town Historic District to the National Register of Historic Places. It was Florida's first traditional cultural property listing and the nation's first non-Native American TCP, traditional cultural property, district. As such, it is considered a model for the state and the nation. Greek Town itself is significant for its tenacious continuity of traditional culture, extensive Greek infrastructure, and is the only Greek American community based on the sponge industry. Now, today, uh, this won't be quite as fluffy uh, as usual, but I'm going to do some educational things because I'd like to tell you more about traditional cultural properties. There are a whole type of property most people, even most historic preservation professionals, don't know too much about. Um, I'm also going to talk about the history of the Greek uh, town area and the process of creating this unusual nat national register nomination because there are some different things you have to do for traditional cultural properties. Okay, uh, so what are traditional cultural properties? The national, and excuse me for reading, but there's just too much stuff here and I'll forget it all if I don't. Uh, the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 failed to provide clear coverage for the full range of cultural resources. Historic properties were the sole type specified. Intangible cultural elements were considered outside the scope of the law. Thus, Congress's 1980 amendments included a directive to study the means of, quote, preserving and conserving the intangible elements of our cultural heritage, such as arts, skills, folk life, and folk ways, and also to recommend ways to, quote, preserve, conserve, and encourage the continuation of diverse traditional, that is, prehistoric, historic, ethnic, and folk cultural traditions that underlie and are a living expression of our American heritage. In response, it was a Florida folklorist, Orman Loomis, 
who prepared a report called Cultural Conservation. He presented this to Congress in 1983, or actually was presented by the National Park Service and the Library of Congress. It recommended that traditional cultural properties, both those associated with historic properties and those without uh, specific property reference, be more systematically addressed in implementation of the National Historic Preservation Act and other such acts. In the 1980s, National Register Bulletin 38, Guidelines for Evaluating and Documenting Traditional Cultural Properties was prepared. Uh, it was designed to supplement other National Register, which I'm going to call NR, guidance. It was intended to assist in determining whether properties thought to have traditional cultural significance are eligible for inclusion in the NR, and also to assist government agencies and other historic practitioners when nominating them for the NR. Bulletin 38 defined a traditional cultural property as eligible for inclusion in the National Register because of association with cultural practices or beliefs of a living community that are rooted in that community's history and are important in maintaining the continuing cultural identity of the community. They gave examples. Okay, and the one that concerns us with Tarpon Springs is a location where a community has traditionally carried out economic, artistic, or other cultural practices important in maintaining its historic identity. One of the major assumptions underlying Bulletin 38 was that there is, quote, a naturally dynamic relationship between tangible and intangible traditional cultural resources, and the practices or beliefs associated with a traditional cultural property are of central importance in defining its significance. Bulletin 38 also notes that TCPs are often hard to recognize and may not be revealed through archaeological, historical, or architectural surveys, which are the usual types of surveys associated um, with um, defining uh, a district. Therefore, it recommends interviews or other types of ethnographic research uh, that should be carried out by cultural anthropologists or folklorists. TCPs are not a separate and distinct type of NR category, but an overlay of traditional cultural significance that may be associated with a property otherwise listed in or eligible for listing in the NR such as a building, structure, district, object, or site. In addition, TCPs are expected to maintain a continuity of cultural association into the present, though it is acknowledged that traditional cultural significance and use may evolve and change over time. In practice, the majority of sites nominated as traditional cultural properties since the time the Bulletin 38 came out have been Native American sacred sites, yet Bulletin 38 specifies Americans of every ethnic origin have properties to which they ascribe traditional cultural value, and if such properties meet the NR criteria, they can and should be nominated for inclusion in the register. So, uh, now, more recently, in preparation, In preparation for the National Park Service's 100th anniversary in 2016, the agency issued a call to modernize historic preservation methods and technologies, show how historic structures can be made sustainable, and support efforts to rebuild the economic and vitality of rural and urban communities. And to that end, it conducted a review and update of Bulletin 38, and in April 2012 began soliciting nationwide input and dialogue. They also began actively encouraging the nomination of more non-Native American TCPs, which is where we come in. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Greek version of the history and culture of Tarpon Springs. Uh, in the early 20th century, Greek immigrants significantly expanded and changed Florida's sponge industry. In Greece, sponge diving crews from the Dodecanese islands of Kalimnos, Halki, and Simi, and the Saronic Gulf islands of Aegina and Idra learned about opportunities in Tarpon Springs. 
In 1905, about 500 men arrived. Within a couple years, there were 100 sponge boats and up to 1,500 Greeks working Florida waters, as well as many others in related maritime businesses. As Phyllis said, in 1908, they founded the Sponge Exchange as a cooperative warehouse with a central courtyard for sponge processing and auctions. Using both deep sea diving and hooking techniques on boats with sails and eventually engines, the Greeks revolutionized the sponge business. Tarpon Springs became the largest sponge port in the US and sponges were Florida's most lucrative sea, sea product at a time when Florida, a lot of Florida's business was based on maritime products. Greeks continued to settle in Tarpon Springs throughout the 20th century, seeking better opportunities in a difficult industry and escape from deteriorating political conditions in their homeland. At first, they arrived by themselves, lived in boats, in boarding houses, or in tiny shacks near the sponge docks. As their families arrived, they moved into houses in the area called the Fish House, just south of the sponge docks. And here's a map of the area, and in a few minutes, I'll show you some of the nice pictures. But uh, basically, it starts at the Anclote River, up at, up at the north end, and comes all the way down uh, just about here to the bayou, where the Epiphany ceremony is. The influx of the Greeks changed Tarpon Springs forever. Since the 1880s, the town had been dominated by wealthy northerners who built grand winter residences around Spring Bayou and the major avenues. The Greeks, however, established Greek town with residences, stores, churches, restaurants, coffee houses, and recreational facilities, eventually stretching from the sponge docks to the city center. By 1913, as many as half of city residents were Greek, and signs of the railroad station were posted in English and Greek. Many businesses displayed both Greek and American flags. And as you've seen in Tarpon, it's still going on. The sponge industry grew steadily throughout the 1910s and 20s. Although buildings slowed in most of Florida after the collapse of the, of the Florida land boom in 1926, Tarpon Springs continued to develop buoyed by the success of the spongers even during the Greek Great Depression of the 1930s. Greeks gradually began to take more control of municipal politics as the majority or by allying themselves with black Tarponites. African Americans have, had settled in Tarpon Springs since the beginning and some Bahamians had arrived in the late 19th century for the sponge industry. Uh, many subsequently developed close relationships with the Greeks uh, while well, they were both working in the sponge industry, and many learned to speak Greek. Since Greeks came to Tarpon Springs in relatively large numbers, they maintained an unusually large portion of their culture. As Robert Georges wrote, the Florida climate was comparable to that of their home islands. Because of their numbers, they could continue to speak Greek, practice the Greek Orthodox religion, maintain family structure, and perpetuate familiar dietary habit and modes of dress. The men engaged in the same occupation as they had in Greece, and they used the same technology in their work. Theirs was virtually a life transplanted. To those who lived in Greek town, it was a town unto itself. Nicolette Sorakis Henderson, a teacher and former City Historic Preservation Board member, explained, my Greek town was a neighborhood of Greek-speaking friends and relatives, bakeries and grocery stores, where we shopped and were extended credit till the end of the month and could pay our tabs. Everyone knew everyone, and we looked out for each other. After morning chores were done, we visited each other's homes for coffee or just to talk. If our babies were restless and couldn't sleep, we knew to go to Callie's house. If you had ringworm or the mati, which is the evil eye, you went to Nikki Ergus's. Our neighborhood was self-sufficient. We didn't have to look farther than our backyards for help. There are still a few of the sponger shacks in the area. The Caffeinea still attract, attract Greeks of all generations. Many of the residents are now third and fourth generation Greek Americans who choose to live in ancestral homes or are returning to their roots. That's the end of her quote. The emerging ethnic character of Tarpon Springs happened to coincide with the development of mass tourism in the early 20th century. So businesses based on cultural tourism developed early. For example, the 1939 WPA Guide to Florida characterized Tarpon Springs by its sponge operation and tours, Greek population and festivals, and little else. To outsiders, Greek culture and sponges dominated the town's reputation. 
From 1905 to 40, then, Greeks constituted the numerically dominant cultural group. Respected historian Charles Moskos wrote, with the thriving sponge industry at its basis, Greek Tarpon Springs became more than a Greek town enclave. In fact, it became a Greek town. From 1905 to World War II, Tarpon Springs had a majority Greek population, a situation without parallel in any other town in the United States. In 1940, there were a thousand men engaged in the sponge industry who, with their families, constituted about 2,500 Greek Americans in the town's total population of about 3,400." End quote. Interestingly, but not unpredictably, while numerous scholars such as Moskos, Buxbaum, Adamek, Odzak, and others, uh, they're mostly anthropologists and historians, have documented these figures. Local histories written by Anglo-Americans have chose to primarily focus on Anglo-American and not Greek or African-American history of the town, but that's always the case. With the onset of World War II and the closure of the European market, the supply of sponges decreased while the demand increased dramatically, and Tarpon Springs became the world's leading sponge producing center. The prosperity was such that St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral, the grandest building in town, was constructed in 1943 at the height of the war. Although they maintained their traditional cultures, over the years, Greeks increasingly participated in American life, and eventually many moved out of the Greek town area. Now, looming underneath the bustle and prosperity of a major international business was economic disaster. In the 1930s, a sponge disease spread north in the Caribbean and the Atlantic, destroying the Bahamian, Cuban, and other Caribbean sponge beds. By 1948, it devastated the Florida beds. And simultaneously, Mediterranean sponges that had been stopped by the war flooded the market, and DuPont introduced cheap synthetic sponges. Tarpon Springs sponge harvest plummeted. From 1947 to 57, the sponge industry nearly collapsed and many families left for jobs in the steel mills of Ohio or Indiana. By the time the beds recovered 10 to 20 years later, most of the divers, captains, and their children had entered more secure occupations. Nevertheless, Tarpon Springs survived and thrived by switching its economic focus. In the late 40s and early 50s, tourism edged out sponges to become the city's biggest source of income. In 1948 and 53, two commercial films, 16 Fathoms Deep and Beneath the 12 Mile Reef, assisted this process by popularizing romantic ideas about the sponge industry and publicizing Tarpon Springs. In addition, epiphany ceremonies gained national attention and drew thousands. By the late 1970s, an estimated one-third of residents were Greek or of Greek descent in a town that then numbered 13,000. Sponge fishing continued on a limited basis till the 1980s. Then, due to catastrophic sponge mortalities in the eastern Mediterranean in 1986, Tarpon, sponge ex Tarpon Springs experienced a major revival that supported, supported about 40 working boats. But by 1996, due to pollution and other, other causes, it decreased to eight to 10 working boats, plus a few others working periodically. Today, the Greek Town District, uh, which is about 140 acres, with 296 contributing buildings, sites, and structures, and about a dozen sponge boats, preserves a strong ethnic and maritime character. <coughs> it's, excuse me. Its population and overall culture have remained relatively stable for over a century. While some major U.S. cities have a larger Greek population, none has a greater percentage of residents today than Tarpon Springs. Greektown is also the epicenter of a 40-mile cor corridor that hosts such a large ethnic population that the Greek government established a consulate in Tama, Tampa, a relatively small city for a consulate. That corridor was largely generated as Tarpon Springs Greeks spread outside the city for employment and education and were joined by many other Greeks and Greek Americans with different regional backgrounds. Tourism, Tarpon Springs' economic engine, 
remains primarily cultural tourism, focusing on its Greek heritage and the sponge industry. It is centered in Greek town, especially Dodecanese Boulevard, along the sponge docks. There are many kinds of touristic businesses selling sponges, clothing, icons, trinkets, as well as boat cruises. Greek eateries are frequented by locals and tourists, and in addition, there are still many ethnic businesses that cater primarily to locals, such as Athens Street's Greek market, bakeries, and traditional caffeinia, or coffee houses. Those are gender exclusive, that means women stay out, uh, establishments where men gather to imbibe coffee and spirits, play cards, smoke, and discuss politics or sports. And there are stores that also sell Greek music, books, and children's games. Despite the influx of tourists, many residents maintain such a strong sense of cultural in-group cohesion that it is difficult for non-Greeks uh, non to penetrate sometimes. Greek identity is expressed and reinforced through a wide array of everyday activities and special events that are part of the traditional culture. It is reflected not only in the boats and built environment, including the sponge docks, which is one of Florida's few downtown working waterfronts. It's not a sidewalk, and it's not actually there for tourists. It's a working waterfront. Uh, but it is a great, a great site for tourists to enjoy. But the culture is also in intangible cultural expressions, such as occupations, music and dance and restaurants, are embedded in community events, social or regional organizations, rites of passage, beliefs, family values, foodways, sacred and secular events, and religious practices. According to Pinellas County records, over 76% of Greek town properties are currently still owned by Greeks. Um, and Nicolette Tsarakis Henderson and others estimate that in the past, maybe up to 98% of residents were Greek, and that figure was probably good into the 1980s. Um, district residents still retain many aspects of pan Greek, Greek regional, and Greek American culture in their daily lives at home, work, or in, re or in religious environments. Greek is not only widely spoken, it's also the primary language in many homes, and some residents remain monolingual in Greek. Thus, as the commercial and residential center of the Greek community that developed due to the sponge industry, Greek town is significant under the National Register Criterion A, a property associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of history with significance in the area of ethnic heritage and maritime history. Uh, and since its residents have maintained a considerable portion of Greek and maritime culture, its period of significance stretches from 1905 to the present. In addition, it fulfills not only TCP criteria for an urban neighborhood that is the traditional home of a particular group and that reflects its beliefs and practices, but serves as a, an exceptionally clear model for, for a TCP district. Okay, let's see. I am just going to run through the nice images and then t tell you a little bit about what makes a TCB, TCP nomination different than others. This is was discovered during the process of, um, of the nomination. Uh, it hadn't really been described before, but of course locals knew about it. It's called locally, uh, they're called locally skila spitia, which mean literally dog houses. The diver, they're actually diver shacks, which had no plumbing because the divers didn't need it, because most of the time they spent at the coffee houses, which were a few blocks away, or on the boats. Sponge warehouse, uh, the sponge exchange, this is down by the docks, um, during one of the night in the islands, but you can see an old historic boat now owned by the city there. Uh, St. Uh, Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral. Uh, St. Michael's, which is a vernacular uh, religious structure. Uh, and here we have St. Michael's Feast Day. Uh, oops. This is the coffee house Phyllis was referring to that was established in uh, 1913. This is a famous photo from 1947, and here it is a few years ago, still in operation. Uh, here are some uh, men from um, 
uh, a hepa making kaorma, a traditional uh, Greek meat dish that used to be taken out on the sponge boats, now done for special occasions. This is during the blessing of the boats. Uh, that uh, uh, The man on the left uh, is um, a bishop, he, though he comes from the town of Tarpon Springs, but he's now the bishop of San Francisco and also a part of Turkey, the Dardanelles. And on the right, the sponge boat captain. Uh, the Epiphany Procession, uh, Epiphany back in 1914, diving for the cross for Epiphany. Um, here's a, a woman showing um, kids how to make Lazarakia, which is for St. Lazarus Day um, before Easter. Uh, this is an example of um, you know, more religious culture, Holy Thursday, which is the Thursday before Easter at St. Nicholas. Uh, this is Holy Friday, before they do the, um, the procession. This is the procession with the epitaphio um, going around the area. This is another one. Uh, here's a goat and lamb fattening up in the yard um, just before Easter, uh, which is still going on traditionally, perhaps not entirely legally. Uh, and here we are uh, doing some traditional uh, lamb cooking in, uh, on Easter Day. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is a wedding in the cathedral where they're putting the uh, wedding crowns on the bride and group. Uh, say, uh, Greek Independence Day, um, Night in the Islands, which is, sort of brings back the Glendi or the Greek celebration that used to occur in the sponge exchange down, back down to the Ock docks and has been really embraced by the Greek community and others. Uh, this is the Anastasi, a uh, Greek sponge boat, the only uh, Greek style sponge boat still working. Uh, although about 200 such boats were built here along the banks of the Anclo River over the course of the early part of the 20th century primarily. Uh, and here is an evil eye uh, amulet on the front of the uh, sponge boat another intangible cultural item. Uh, this is an example of the use of the docks. Uh, it's used for loading and unloading the boats, uh, uh, sorting the sponges, and this is uh, one of the, the biggest sponge harvest in recent history, pretty much took up the entire docks area. Uh, this is a guy trimming the sponges. This is Nick Toth, who still makes the diving helmets. This is one of his diving helmets here. This is George Sarukos. Both George, George, Nick, and also the um, uh, the captain of the sponge boat you saw are all Florida Folk Heritage Award winners for their traditional culture. He is the last sponge boat maker, and he made that boat you saw. Uh, here's some kids uh, going around doing Greek Christmas car caroling or kalenda in the Greek town district. This is one of was one of our famous uh, Greek bazooki musicians lived on Athens Street. This is one of the glendies that used to take place in the Sponge Exchange, um, Night in the Islands, dance troupe. That is in fact a, a, a one of our policemen who's Greek who's doing a very special thing, which is giving money out to the dancers in. Um, uh, because he likes what they're doing. Uh, this is uh, our Bazooki uh, Youth Orchestra performing. And that's about it now, very quickly, because I'm running out of time, but I got started late. Um, I found out that the National Register was doing, was, it was requesting nominations for non-native TCPs uh, when I attended the 2012 um, uh, American Folklore Society meeting. And there was, were representatives from the National Register there, there Paul Lusignan. Uh, and I immediately realized that, and having worked as a state folklorist, I knew a lot of traditional communities around Florida. They were talking about Little Havana and others. I realized Greek Town was the place because of its limited size, continual population, maintenance of traditional culture, it was more doable and more ongoing than any other place in Florida. Uh, and it was just a shoe in in my eyes. So I started working with our state historic preservation officer, Barbara Maddock, who, as it happened, was also my supervisor and with whom I had worked at the Bureau because I worked there for 13 years, the Bureau of Historic Preservation. And we also worked with Paul Lusignan at the National Register because what we were doing had not ever really been done before, which was to try to fit a district nomination, which is basically based on 
nomination forms that have a lot to do with building style, uh, building materials, things like that. And what we were really dealing with were all the elements of traditional culture. So we were hammering out the whole process as we went along in many ways for the first time. Um, so, but one of the things that really helped that was to form a working group of people who grew up in the area who walked me around it and defined the boundaries of the district with me. And we had to look at things like, okay, that this Simeon neighborhood with all the people from Simi used to be part of the district, but the people from Simi moved out, so we couldn't include that. On the other hand, we included one of the old sponge warehouses, although it function, its function had changed to be the office of a bridge building company. But bridge building companies in this area are predominantly owned by Greeks, hire a lot of Greeks, and have essentially taken the same place and have the same work pattern of going away for long periods of time as the sponge industry did. So it is essentially has new owners, but is fulfilling a similar function. So uh, another, so I did this. I'd been doing research in the area for years because I live on Athens Street. Uh, I just got all the materials together, investigated county property records to find out who held all these properties because I couldn't go into 400 different buildings, although I'd been in many of them and knew what was going on. But we used the property records to determine the, that there were 76% Greek held buildings and I knew and we had to and when you saw in those photos, those traditional cultural activities were related in the applications to particular physical locations, and that was very important. The other important thing in town was to get the buy-in from the community and the city, um, and one way to do that, uh, there, uh, because they were not crazy about uh, historic preservation codes being brought down on them, but traditional culture is defined as being constantly changing and evolving uh, by, as it's written in, the, in Bulletin 38 and many other places. That means the, that they should not have to be constrained by the sort of unchanging building codes to keep things the way they were in a historic period. And so everyone agreed to that, the city, the Greek community, and so on. That was a very important element of getting this by. It then uh, went to the uh, National Register Review Board in the Bureau of Historic Preservation. And a lot of the staff sat in on this because they wanted to know how this process worked. Also, uh, one of the prime people at the National Register also participated in the discussion to push this along. So it got very good reception, and um, uh, the Bureau provided a map, a CAD map, to go with the nomination. And I think, um, I think all in all, it's been a very good thing. Also, because it's eligible for the register, now we have some protection through Section 106 reviews. If there are any uh, threats to the culture, um, you know, and to the area, you know, that has to be, if there's any federal money or permits involved, that has, it has to go through a review before those, uh, that, uh, those particular uh, permits or money can be um, awarded. Unfortunately, uh, Greektown is now, as is other parts of Tarpon Springs, is now experiencing a threat from increasing and severe flooding uh, at the sponge docks from the Anclote River, which is caused by rising tides combined with the need for dredging the river again, which is very important. And while Pinellas County has been less affected than places in Florida like Miami or St. Augustine, historic preservationists like Leslie Keyes have shown that in the near future, we are going to face the choice, not of how to save all of our precious historic and cultural resources, because we are not going to be able to. We are going to have to choose which ones we are going to have the resources and time to save. So thank you.
Okay, as you can see, the next presentation is uh, about Rose Hill Cemetery, um, and I'll let Tina M. see this. We're quite a bit behind, so uh, do your best to get through this, if you would, please. Okay. Um, I'll try to go quickly. Um, Rose Hill is significant as the best example in Pinellas County of an intact African-American cemetery. Unlike other such cemeteries in the county that have suffered neglect and destruction, Rose remains viable and with less disruption of grave sites. It occupies the same land and continues to have strong support by families with loved ones buried here. In addition, it has an unusually long period of significance, 1904 to 2000, because interviews with community members and an African-American funeral home director indicate very few African American burials in the municipal cemetery until approximately 2000. This reflects an extended period of social, though not legal, segregation. Rose Cemetery also reflects many Southern historical and cultural burial practices. I just want to say a, a few words uh, briefly before I get into the cemetery about the African American community, and I know Annie is going to talk more about that from her experience. Um, but African Americans first arrived in Tarpon Springs after the Civil War, and many arrived from other parts of Florida and the South during the 1880s. Um, uh, they were particularly important to the sponge industry um, in the early 1880s. Families arrived from Key West, the Bahamas, and other Caribbean islands to work here. And throughout the 20th century, these connections continued to attract Bahamian immigration, as did opportunities for migrant workers uh, in the fishing and sawmill businesses. Um, And uh, even after the Greeks came, many African Americans retained their own boats. They had been primarily hookers, uh, which hooked uh, hooking sponges as opposed to divers. Um, but many of them also worked on Greek boats as crew or divers. People until recently did not widely know that, that there were also uh, African American divers. And as I mentioned, many learned to speak Greek. Um, Initially, many lived, as Phyllis said, in cabins in the quarters east of Patton Sawmill near the Anclote River, but uh, there were also African-American um, uh, neighborhoods in the small community of Sponge Harbor or Point Alexis, which developed at the mouth of the Anclote River, which was near the Bailey's Bluff area where uh, sponging was done before uh, it came um, uh, into Tarpon Springs, and some early uh, families built homes in the southeast section where they could maintain gardens and farm animals. This was known as Charlestown and located along uh, east of Lemon Street between South Levis and South Pinellas Avenues near East Martin Luther King Jr. Drive and is the site of today's primary community. Um, I do want to note uh, Members of the African American community have always maintained strong religious faith, and their churches were among the first in Tarpon Springs. And according to the uh, state archives, Mount Herman Baptist Church was officially constituted in 1884 at the corner of Athens and Eagle, which actually makes it the first church established in Tarpon Springs, officially established. Um, uh, there were many others, including Mount Moriah in 1890 and, and many more. Uh, now, Rose Cemetery, uh, historically known as Rose Hill Cemetery, is the oldest African-American cemetery in Pinellas County. The earliest recorded burial dates to 1904, but there are strong indications of earlier interments, and some believe that it was used by black community members as far back as the 1870s. It was originally owned by the Lake Butler Villa Company and is just east of the city cemetery, Cicadia. <coughs> uh, the cemetery's period of significance, as I says, said, is from 1904 to 2000. 
Um, veterans from the Civil War and subsequent wars are interred in the graveyard as are prominent, prominent community members and many who worked in the sponge industry. Grave markers, both commercial and handmade, are constructed of marble, granite, concrete, wood, bronze, and stainless steel, reflecting a wide variety of artistic styles and levels. Cultural beliefs from African and Southern Ameri American traditions are apparent in the east-west orientation of graves, scraping of the grounds, positioning of chairs and benches and decorative elements on the graves, such as conch shells, and the symbols engraved in the markers themselves. Rose Hill Cemetery was established as a private entity to officially create a separate black burial ground in accord with segregationist practices of the era. In 1916, the Lake Butler Villa Association um, gave a 99-year lease to the Citizens Board. In 1917, the property was deeded to Rose Hill Association. In the 1940s, uh, the association peti petitioned the city and the state of Florida for land surrounding the cemetery to accommodate increased usage. And that increased the total cemetery area to 4.63 acres. Throughout the 1950s, Rose Cemetery served communities, black communities throughout the county. Difficulties during, the, during those years, or throughout the years, included destroyed records, um, limited funding, and that, that resulted in unmarked and misplaced graves at times. By the 1960s and 70s, a grave, graves were becoming inconsistently cared for as many family members moved away. And uh, though burials continued, dates and details of ownerships were not always accurately recorded. Um, that began to improve in the 1990s under the presidency of Al Quarterman, and uh, there came to be increased uh, organization of cleanups and awareness campaigns, installation of a decorative steel gate, and um, many other activities. In 1999, a survey of cemetery headstones found approximately 600 um, marked graves, but caretakers knew there were about 1,000 buried there. Volunteers recovered the names and dates of those burials, and they used Pinellas County ground-penetrating radar equipment to find 200 unmarked graves, and cadaver-sniffing dogs found another 20. The newly found graves were given stainless steel markers, and a map was made documenting all the grave locations. So I'm going to show you a few uh, of the, uh, a few um, images from the graveyard. This is the gate at the primary entrance. This is the earliest gravestone from 1904. Uh, this is views from different areas. I believe this is looking east. <coughs> this is <coughs> looking towards the west. West again. Um, I think this is the, this is towards the uh, northeast corner. Uh, these are some of the graves. This is one of the most recent graves uh, that was uh, had been dug when I documented it. Uh, these are various areas. This is the Quarterman family plot, which shows that it's common in uh, southern graveyards to um, to make uh, to put in, at times to put in chairs and benches and th things like that for visitation by family members. Uh, this is an example. This is not uh, this is not a lawn cemetery, at, as had sometimes been mistakenly assumed, uh, which is a more recent phenomenon in the South. Uh, many uh, cemeteries were traditionally raked uh, rather than having lawns. There was not irrigation for lawns. So raking uh, got rid of the weeds, and uh, you can see um, the impression of rakes. It sort of it kept everything um, in order and in its place. And that is the case uh, with Rose Hill Cemetery which makes a big difference because you probably don't want people uh, who f think it's a lawn cemetery to come in and simply change the traditional character of the cemetery. 
Um, these are some women, in fact, uh, raking. It's also called, called scraping the cemetery. This is one of those uh, new markers uh, on uh, some of the unmarked graves. Uh, I'm just going to show you some other kinds of markers, <clears throat> the various kinds, upright, rectangular. Uh, this is this was put in by Young's Funeral Home. Um, African American funeral homes are <clears throat> very important to this and to all African American communities. And in an interesting note, uh, traditionally they were some of the most important and earliest African American businesses. Uh, really, the one of the first known ones was started in 1876, and the reason. Um, uh, was so that they could ca take care of people in their communities during times of uh, continued segregation. And Young's, I believe, is still, uh, an, is still an active cemetery, and they sometimes provide markers for the people that they bury. And as I said, up until around 2000, um, there were few African-American burials in Cicadia. Most of them were in rows, and, and many uh, new burials do continue to be in rows. So what's a happy cemetery? A happy cemetery, there's a couple of them right around here, Cicadia and Rose Hill, of course, has friends with a plan. Uh, and these are just part of the objectives of the cemetery training that we put together. It's recorded with the Florida Master Site File. And again, that's just kind of the basic level, the basic inventory of archeological and historic sites in the state of Florida. Has never seen bleach, right? Cleaning those headstones. We wanna use some proper materials and that's what we try to promote through the training. Um, is recorded in text and pictures, and that's one of the um, really most important aspects that we can do, not only to uh, record these individual historic cemeteries as sites, but also go in and get a good transcription record of these places and, and of all the information there. Um, and is visited and loved, uh, not lonely and forgotten. Um, I think the, while the site file prov provides that basic legal protection for an archeological or historic site, it's really our eyes and ears as a community that provides the essential protection for these places. Um, in a lot of cases, unfortunately, and you guys may be well aware of more than a few of them, um, once that marked cemetery, once all those visible remains are kind of removed from cemeteries, that cemetery pretty much no longer exists or ceases to exist. It may exist on maps, but they're hard to find, and it does take quite an effort with cadaver dogs and remote sensing gear and apparatus to really locate those things, but we can't, for the most part, ever really identify those people where they are when those remains are gone. And so that was really the basic premise that we wanted to create this training for. And so it reaches all three of the core work areas that we uh, operate under to assist local governments and the Division of Historical Resources and provide education and outreach. We created a Crypt Alliance Facebook page, and so this is not just for uh, veterans of the Crypt trainings, you know, people that have participated in our workshops. Anybody can sign up and request to be included, and it's a good way just to learn more about cemetery preservation techniques and good kind of basic principles that we can do to ensure the long lives of these really important places for our communities. So the, the objectives that we put together for, for the, the cemetery training was to increase the number of recorded cemeteries across Florida to aid in the preservation of these sites, um, demonstrate minimal management practices, and it was really great to work with the city of Tarpon Springs and the staff people that are out there at Cicadia. Um, such a dedicated staff really makes that one of the a premier cemetery in our region, but also to raise awareness um, about the federal, state, and local laws that uh, protect cemeteries and human burial sites. And so those are just a few of the things that we go over. So I'll end on this one really quickly. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we really created the training. In Pinellas County alone, we've got 16 cemeteries that are recorded on the site file. And if you go to find a grave, you'll see that there's 92 that are listed. And that's not unusual. Um, Hillsborough County has 24 listed on the site file. Um, and there's about 140 that are, that are out there on find a grave that aren't listed. So we've got a lot of work cut out for us as far as you know, really trying to um, identify and get this basic level of, of legal protection for all of these places, all these really significant spots. Um, because 
I think one of the most important things in thinking about it as an archaeologist, you know, grave sites and, and cemeteries are, are really important. There's a lot of stuff buried in the ground. Um, and a, a lot of those things can tell us, you know, who we are as, as uh, who our pioneers were, who the early settlers were, what uh, Greek culture might have been like in case the waters really do rise up, you know, and we've got these cemeteries recorded as places where we can go find all this stuff. Um, but it's not just what's in the ground is important. There's a lot of grave goods above the ground. And so that's, the, that's really kind of the basis, another basis of why we created the cemetery training. What can we do? What are the minimal practices we can do to really um, extend the life of these resources that are threatened, you know, as, as anything above ground in, in Florida environment and atmosphere. We're all kind of withering away, I guess, you know, with this nice salty air. But anyways, um, that's all I've got to say, so I'll go ahead. Pass the mic. Thank you again for having me today. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm a native Coppin Knight, and I also serve as secretary for Rose Hill Cemetery Association. really to talk about the preservation of the Rose Cemetery. But before I do that, I'd like to share this quote with you. It comes from the father of black history, Dr. Carter G. Wilson. And he says this, those who have no record of what their forbearers have accomplished lose the inspiration which come from the teaching of their biography and history, In the quote. Rose Cemetery is like all the black cemeteries across the United States. They fall into disrepair and neglect. Many are not brave because there is no funding for black cemeteries. But fortunately for Tompkins Springs, the community decided to come together under the leadership of Mr. Alfred Waterman. We have community leaders, volunteers, Nonprofit organizations, family members came together and says, we are going to clean up Rose Cemetery. We rake leaves, we trim trees, we trim bushes, the city provide containers, and it was all hauled away. So we are in a work in progress to maintain the perpetual care of Rose Cemetery. And I do have to mention, because they have done a lot of work, the Rotary Club of Topham Springs. We are grateful. So we, and as I think about cemeteries, I said, we all want to be remembered. And a cemetery is a place to be remembered. I believe that we all deserve to be remembered. Every one of us here. What about you? A cemetery to me represents so many lives, so many smiles, tears, kisses, laughter, sickness, sadness. That's life. God granted each of us a life and death. Now, if you were to take a tour and walk through Rose Cemetery today, you will see that the monuments that are there, every one has a different story to tell. History about our culture, yes, 
Why do we want to preserve that? We want to teach it to our children and to our children's children. We want them to know where they came from. Hopefully it will help where they are going. In our own story of accomplishment and its success is now a part of our culture history. Cemeteries, burials, and human remains have a special place in all human cultures from the earliest time to this present. Special care for ancestors and for the deceased is one of the defining traits of us being human. Few concerns in our daily lives rise to the same level of importance as ensuring the respectful and the proper treatment of the deceased. Families, communities, and even the federal government go to great length to recover missing human remains and ensure a respectful final resting place. Every day we read, and, and, and I know we have all have read it or heard it on TV, about families wanting to bring closure. Someone is missing. Last week they found a 13-year-old girl, remember? They're still looking for a 14-year-old boy, but the family will not give up. They want to bring closure and give a proper resting place to that young man. That's what we want to do. Because of the accomplishment and success stories of the past, we are proud of the many accomplishments of our ancestors. But we must never forget the contribution and the sacrifices they had made as our ancestors. Our history plays an important vital role in our everyday life. We learn from our past in order to achieve greater influences in our history. Our history serves as a model. We have worked to clean up Rose Cemetery, and we still are doing that. Rose Cemetery today provides a prominent place that can be visited regularly by the family and friends of the deceased. It's become a focal point of memorialization, and it gives everyone a special place to to, that reminds them of their loved ones and to commemorate important occasions for the Union Academy residents and the families who have touched many lives in the Union Academy community and Tarpon Springs as a whole. This form of recognition will create a lasting legacy while reflecting on the national beauty, the natural beauty. I'm talking about God's created, the natural beauty, a rose cemetery of what this has to offer. And I'm brief today. The mission of Rose Cemetery is this, to preserve the legacy and increase public awareness of African-American contributions by highlighting the powerful stories of our ancestors, our community leaders, including religious leaders, religious community activists, and of course, our veterans. We have veterans out there from the United States Army, World War II, 
the Air Force, the Marines, all branches of the United States military is recognized at Grove Cemetery. So we want those citizens who helped to build the city of Toppin Springs and they have not gone on to their reward. We want them and laid, we want you to know that they laid the groundwork for Tompkins Springs and the nation. Now there's a lot of black history, but unfortunately, there's a lot that is not known. And that is our mission at Rose Cemetery, to make it known to the people of Tarkin Springs and the nation. And one last quote I will share with you from James and Rosalind Johnson. And this is how it goes. The Johnson brothers says it the best. Stony the road we have traveled. Bitter the chest and raw. Felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our father sought. We have come over a way that with tears had been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past, till we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Thank you. Okay, um, I said a moment ago we're running a little bit behind, but I think we've got the ability to make it up and, and stay pretty much with what we had hoped to present to you for the remainder of the afternoon. So with that, I think it's time for a little break, but we've got a special treat here in terms of that break, um, and that is that uh, this facility is blessed with some extraordinary artwork, and we have the pleasure of having with us today um, the artist uh, responsible for that work. So I'm going to ask uh, Christopher Still to come forward. Chris is a native Floridian, he graduated from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and continued his studies with courses in human anatomy at Jefferson Medical School and an apprentice in traditional techniques in, in Florence, Italy. Um, he's earned awards for outstanding accomplishments in painting, uh, European, European Travel Fellowship and the Pennsylvania Governor's Award for Outstanding Accomplishments in Fine Arts. His paintings can be found in museums and private collections, including the Governor's Mansion uh, of Florida and the Smithsonian Institution. That's pretty impressive. Um, and what Chris is going to do is he's going to get uh, take you on a tour. I have 3.30 on my watch, um, and so I'm going to ask you to be back here at 3.45, 15 minutes, and Chris is going to take you in and show you some of his work and explain it to you. And uh, I, I mean this in the, in the most complimentary way I can think of it. When I first saw these paintings, I thought, now I understand what it is to be swimming with the fishes. I hope that's a compliment. Chris Still. You all are my heroes. You're my database. Um, and um, I uh, just we're going to go up there and look at things real quickly. The real background of me is my father became a history teacher at Clearwater High School in 1957. And a man named Ralph Reed came over to him and said, could you help me move the stuff out of my house to the basement of the Clearwater Courthouse? And in that basement, he did a series of murals with his students. And I saw my dad working through the community with a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder saying, we live in an area of people coming from around the world with these stories. 
And instead of staying in the classroom, you should get out and take those stories in. And many of you know me very well. When I have an architectural question, I'm to Ed Hoffman. And good grief, now that his dad's gone, I've lost my whole aviation, my, my incredible, you know, just my resources. Here's Heather Culligan from, uh, uh, from Heritage Village. Vinny Luisi, you come in if I know I need to learn about trains, I need to learn about Dunning, I need to go. Uh, Terry Fortner, who's an amazing family, lived out on, on Caladesi Island and the very amazing legacy of that. Many, many more of you that are in here um, are always my, uh, my uh, go-to people for information. Phyllis Kulianis, you know, talking about uh, Frank Hamilton Cushing and Wheaton Island. So um, if we could move in the other room, I'm going to take you on a quick tour. The paintings that are in there are reproductions of some paintings that were done. And uh, I'll try to be brief so that um, uh, we can stay on the, stay with the agenda. Thank you. everybody. First off, I hope you're enjoying our museum and that you'll come back and visit us. Uh, Tarpon Arts is giving each of you a bag. I think I've gotten everybody. Inside that bag is a voucher for a ticket, a free ticket to see Cole Quartet on October 21st. It'll give you a great chance to go over and see the historic City Hall. Yay. And all of the renovations that have been done both inside and out, which are incredible. Also, there's some historic books over on the counter that we are selling for you guys for 50% off. If you want any on your way out this evening, there will be somebody to help take care of you. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is, um, is gonna to speak to you about working within the National Register Historic Places District Developing and, and Restoration. Our speaker is Joseph Koliakos. Uh, Mr. Koliakos is both a de local developer and a current owner of Co Kokolakis Construction Contracting. His projects range from office and warehouse facilities in New York to retail and residential development in Florida. With nearly 28 years of construction industry experience, he also manages the day-to-day -day operations of uh, Kokolakis Contracting a $175 million per year public works contractor currently working in the Northeast and in Florida. Mr. Kokolakis, uh, understanding of both the technical and practical aspects of construction management has led to the successful completion of many notable projects uh, in the Tampa Bay area, Victoria Place in Dunedin, um, Ybor City Amphitheater, the bunker in Ybor City, and so on. He said that his presentation involves a small house and will go very quickly. <laughs> Good afternoon. Yes, yeah, I was always told never, never speak after a break, and uh, and and, and I learned I never speak after Christopher Stokes because his, his his passion is is contagious and overwhelming for the community. Um, and I honestly think that Phyllis only asked me to speak today because she looks at me as some sort of developer who who found Jesus and was converted to the historic preservation uh, mindset. And, and, and that's not necessarily the case, but, well, for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one, I'm not really a developer. I kind of look at myself as a contractor who has been performing historic restoration work for close to 30 years uh, throughout, uh, well, throughout the East Coast, at least, um, currently working up at West Point on projects that are, you know, 120 years old that we're uh, uh, renovating. And down in Ybor City, you know, the, the uh, Florida or brewing company building and things like that. And, and by working with these buildings, you do develop an incredible appreciation for them. But as an investor, it's very difficult to quantify the, and substantiate the cost of restoring an old house like this one. And frankly, I was you know, first introduced to the HPB because I planned on demolishing this house. And, and the reason was that it didn't make sense in my pro forma to keep it. And what the HPB did was sit me down and sort of discuss the process and discuss the value of the home 
and the, uh, and the impact it would have on the community to lose the home. And, the, and I guess I was sold because it was a lot more than just math. Because frankly, I can build anything and make it look old and have new air conditioning and new windows and a new roof that doesn't leak. But, but preserving a historic structure means so much more to a community because it preserves your story, just like the cemeteries that we heard of earlier, um, or the artwork and what, what Christopher captures in his paintings, it preserves our story. And again, just on the financial side of things, I can quantify the return on that. As a father, I've got three kids, and my goal in life is to get those three kids who are currently going to school in different towns to come home. They're gonna come home because of the story in their community. They're gonna come home because businesses are attracted to a community with a history. Uh, downtown core that has historic structures that, that are welcoming and inviting and, and meet ADA codes and things like that that we, we spoke about, but without compromising the integrity of the structure. Um, those businesses will provide jobs and create a hip and cool community uh, that my children will wanna come back to. And, and I believe that you know, whatever, whatever you know, commissioners and city managers are still here, rather than incentivizing companies to open up offices through tax breaks and grants, I think ensuring that the integrity of the community through historic preservation and the arts and are maintained, that will bring the businesses and those businesses will lead to growth. Um, so this little house was symbolic to me in many ways. It, it perfectly illustrated the working process with the HPB. Their, their requests or criteria were very well defined, which again, as an investor, you can put a dollar to it, so there were no surprises. They were open to discussion and trade-offs between, between uh, environmentally uh, friendly, artistically or architecturally maybe not 100% correct windows, but sustainable windows. Um, or, or uh, at least uh, at least insulated triple pane windows. So you know they were they were open to different ideas. We moved the house across the street. We worked well together, and it's a success story for the town because it's the first of hopefully what will be many historic restorations that would lead to new residents that will live in the downtown core, hopefully work in the downtown core, and and truly live, work, and play in Tarpon Springs. So that's quick enough. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, the final formal program, and I'm going to say, apologize ahead of time perhaps to um, one of the hardest working people in this process, Chris Moore, who um, is the lead staff person in support of the board. Chris is a planner, uh, historic planner in the planning department in Pinellas County. And Chris, stand up, just so everybody recognize you again. We have, Chris is an invaluable asset and dedicated to uh, supporting the board and all the crazy things that we ask him to do. We've had him on the agenda to give a report and we've bumped him off the agenda twice already. I'm, I'm fearful it might be a third time, but we're gonna try to get him in here. But I wanted to, to at least give him credit to, um, in case that doesn't happen. All right, our final segment then. We've got ourselves about an hour, so um, here's what we had planned. The, one of the ongoing and underlying themes of historic preservation is, is that we in Pinellas County are fortunate to live in an area that has a rich history of architecture, uh, let alone the folklore that, uh, that surrounds all of that. We also are blessed to have towns and neighborhoods that have historic context and a history. I live in St. Petersburg in an area called Old Northeast. If you've never been to Old Northeast, go there. If you've never been to Kenwood Historic District, go there. Those two districts are on the National Register of Historic Places and they have no protection. And you'll see an example of what's going on in our community in terms of new construction. Now, none of us here advocate for stopping new construction. We want Florida to grow and prosper. We want our beaches to work. We want the tourists to come down and that we can enjoy not only the lifestyle we want, but ask them to pay for a big share of it. Um, but, the, but the history of our communities is under assault 
by modern day development, which in many, many cases is um, totally ignorant of or uncaring about the historic context in which they intend to build. So this next presentation is going to consist of three different people coming at this problem of how to blend the old from the new in a very different way. Um, Ed Hoffman, a local architect, is going to talk to you about a piece of property that you can see right out the front door here um, and how it can de be developed in an older or new fashion, I believe. Um, we've got, um, we've got uh, uh, Stephanie Farrell who uh, practices in historic preservation in Ybor City. She's going to share with you some of the things that go on in there, and all of us have been to Ybor City, and we know what the fabric is there, but we also see what's going on in new surroundings. And then I'll wrap this thing up and explain to you what we're doing in St. Petersburg and what we've been able to do to try to bring some level of protection and sanity to the intrusion of the big box into our residential neighborhoods. So uh, let me start with uh, Ed, who will do the first presentation. Ed has received his bachelor's and master's degree uh, from the University of Florida, including the Nantucket uh, Preservation Institute in 1973. He started his own firm at age 29 and opened an office in Tarpon Springs in 1982. Ed has received numerous design awards, including the Dean Road Design Award in 2003 for the Lepa Ratner Museum in Tarpon Springs, as well as the facility selected by the Florida AIA as one of the best 100 buildings in Florida in the last 100 years. And I can tell you, speaking as a fellow architect, that's no small achievement to be honored by your peers um, in recognizing uh, your work. Um, his love of architecture is almost uh, surpassed by his love of flying. Hoffman has assisted his father, Ed Sr., we heard about that a moment ago, with the design, building, and test flying of five different aircraft. Ed flew Major Dick, uh, Mayor Dick Greco in 2014 to an open cockpit flying boat across Tampa Bay in reenactment of Tony Janus's 1914 first scheduled airline flight. Hoffman is very active in this community and Tampa Bay and volunteers for many organizations, including Rotary International, the Liba Ratner, Pinellas County Schools, Tarpon Springs Historical Society, and his church. Ed Hoffman. I've got to run a timer on this. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much. Appreciate that, John. Uh, when Phyllis asked me to come, I think she, she asked me because we had been talking about a piece of property that I've had for 22 years. Uh, here on the bayou in the area called the Golden Crescent. Excuse me, it's this clicker? Yes, this one. It's, there's a pointer there too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't see the pointer. Right there. Might have to use. Oh, it, do you? Tiny bit, good. All right. Um, Anyway, so I'll try, I'll try to be quick, but anyway, she, um, Phyllis was asking me, I think, because she knew that I'd had this property this many years, and I was, due, frankly, due just simply too chicken to design something for it. We do a lot of different work um, in our office. We do, uh, whoops, grab mine instead of yours. Um, the area of the property that I was going to talk about, I don't know if you can see that behind the podium, but it's this piece of property here at the end of Tarpon Avenue on the bayou. Uh, and this area is considered, as Phyllis was saying earlier, the Golden Crescent, kind of the birthplace of the bigger, grand things that were going on in Tarpon uh, back at the, the late 1800s and the beginning of the 19th. Um, so I'm going to, well, I'm just going to go through this really quick. This is our corporate head, world corporate headquarters. It's a, it's, it's a hundred and uh, well, it's 1869, um, excuse me, 1889, forgive me. The work we do is, is a real wide variety. This is the building he was talking about, the Leaper Ratner Museum, uh, con contemporary houses, but then also one of our favorite projects was the restoration of the uh, Safford House. The Safford House, is, that's a whole other story. Uh, but this was the way we found it, um, and this is the way we brought it too, with a teamwork, a lot of work by a lot of different people, a lot of, of um, 
anyway, so it's fascinating. And it's a little bit, um, uh, like Joe said, <laughs> you know, that process of making that happen was, was really interesting. But what I'm going to do is, is talk to you about how to, um, what should I be doing with that piece of property? When you look at from that variety of things, and really it is the question is, is where as an architect and us as a community, where are we in the history of Tarpon Springs? There have been all these things and we have all of these benchmarks about who did what, when, but where do we draw the line and say, that's it, we stop there, we close it, we close the door. And so when somebody is walking around the bayou a hundred years from now, are they going to say it all stopped in 1930 or 1970? You know, where does it start and stop? So that's going to be the question. And just kind of as a, uh, what do you call it when you tell the end of the story? Uh, cliffhanger. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> that's going to be an open-ended question. So. Anyway, as we look at this, this is a historic district for Tarpon Springs. Uh, this is our piece of property that Barbara and I have owned uh, for some time. This is Tarpon Avenue, this is the bayou, this is a Golden Crescent. So I'm going to give you some context uh, for the hi history of that area. Uh, Phil has covered a lot of that uh, better a little while ago, but I'm just going to go quickly. This is the uh, piece of property that is referred to as the hotel. This is uh, Tarpon Avenue down on the bayou. This was a, um, a house that was there before this hotel. Again, where, does, where, does, where do you stop history? You know, the Indians were appalled by all of this garbage, right? You know, that was total sacrilege to them, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, so that'll be the, that'll be the uh, question for discussion. And the grandness of that area. This, I think this boat tells a big part of the story. There's all kind of schooners and everything there, these wonderful boat houses. I remember as a kid uh, when I came to Tarpons, you know, was, we lived out in the sticks in the orange groves, but we would come into town when we, we'd do that uh, Sunday afternoon drive with my grandmother, right? That's what we used to do. And uh, people would be up here playing cards and all on these upper levels of these boat houses, which is quite fabulous. The hotel there was, which is across the street from, from our property, our vacant lot here, you know, it's actually four stories, but there's actually almost, a, there's a full story of a basement down below it. So it's almost five stories. A historic picture, again, showing the context. Uh, it's too far away for you to see. This is the hotel on the left with the, um, and you can see it's almost a very urban setting. Um, and then again, the, the bayou with the boat houses, the big boats in there, that was a big, all kinds of celebrations that have happened there. Um, and so, as we look at this, you know, these were the two houses that were on our piece of property, uh, has long been gone. Um, and I could, we could talk about each of these for quite some time, but I won't. So, uh, the question is, is the hotel burnt down. I remember that as a kid when it, not when it burnt, I wasn't old enough, but the ruins, the big charred beams and stuff were laying there in this empty basement, which was always kind of fascinating to me. And then they, um, as we kind of move up uh, from, from ancient history to something a little in between, they did, I think it was the Pappas family that did this, uh, the Gondolier Motel. And uh, actually it's an architect it's a, it's a pretty nice piece of 60s architecture, of modern architecture, the, the Boston beam, a lot of exposed structure, and, and uh, but, and, you know, for, <laughs> some people say better or worse, um, my, if I, <laughs> one way, word or the other, but, um, you know, this is what it is now. So this is the motel across the street. Uh, this is the Fleming House, Terrapanis have it now next to that. I'm just going to take you a whirlwind trip around the bayou uh, to show you, and as you look at these, you kind of say, well, if you're going to put in a new building, what do you borrow? What do you grab? Which one do you use? Why would you use it? You know, those kinds of things. And it's almost like a, a long-term discussion. We talked about the Villa Pomosa Motel, where people stayed uh, there 
uh, for the movie shoot and all that stuff. A lot of history there, which uh, their translation, when that decided to be gone, you know, the translation becomes this. That's the same shot, basically. Um, still called the Villa Pomosa, <laughs> but it's a little different. Um, we have the Clemson House, uh, you know, what, you know, things we're doing there with shingle style. Uh, it's a little sister house next door, uh, the Allworth House. The, um, you know, as we go, that was, I could go on, each one of these pictures I want to kind of talk about for a long time, going to get myself stitched up at Dr. Clough's office and all that kind of stuff when I was a little kid. Uh, you look at the captain's house here that was uh, played around with, put Greek columns on this old Florida vernacular building and, and had a lot of additions. But then when that goes away, this becomes a new house. Is this, is this the answer for building in 2000? Uh, I guess this was 2006 or whatever. Um, so it just raises some question. The house next door to that, the Victorian little house that then was a new paint job. Uh, and then different scales, you know, you have the super scale and then you have this little small house. And then you have something that was done, I guess, maybe 10 years ago, nine or 10 years ago, uh, down on the end there. And coming back to the, the bayou, this piece of property, again, when you, when you go out, you can see it, you probably drove by it to get here. The pr our piece of property is right here, uh, right at the entrance where they show, throw, the, uh, throw the cross. Um, let me turn my phone back on, make sure I got my timer working. Just shut down. Um, anyway. So we kind of go around the bayou and, and uh, look at that setting. Green and green had the influence of the, you know, the kind of the, the um, you know, the bungalow houses and things like that. Um, of course, there was some honest Victorian, this I think 1885 or something that Phyllis could straighten me out on. Um, so we have this, this group of houses that, you know, what, how do we approach that? Um, this house is fascinating architect. Um, I could talk about that later when the name comes to me. That's a whole nother talk. Uh, he's done several houses in Tarpon Springs, an architect. Uh, fabulous houses. Um, and of course, boom time kind of things. Well, in the context of this building, though, this, this lot, it's also now been put into this kind of, you know, the smart code. The, the, the zoning's changed, so they're trying to get us to do, you know, more of an urban thing. Um, what you might call new urbanism. Uh, and so this project you might recognize, at Dunedin, where we're, we're up to the street, things are bigger, you know, is this something we do? Uh, it's walkable, you get the pedestrian, the pedestrian's right on the sidewalk, you engage um, people there, St. Petersburg, um, you know, then down in, uh, you know, similarity is when you, uh, actually in Dunedin, you're going through downtown, and then you go down to the water and you saw the Victoria uh, place. Here in Safety Harbor, somewhat of the same thing, you come down Main Street and then they've built up two new buildings on either side of the street uh, that are you know, three or four stories high um, that has generated a whole new uh, pedestrian, you know, multi-purpose type of a thing and so how are we gonna deal with that? That's the intention of the code for our piece of property. So, as we, look at, as we look at that, this happened to be Ybor and the, uh, you know, making a new, new buildings at the entrance, the west, uh, very west end of it for the hotel. Um, so the challenge is, this is the site. Um, it's, most people know it because that's where all the political signs go. Uh, I have a 30-day limit, Charlie, if, but you're welcome to use it. <laughs> you know, 30 days before the election. But then in between, there's all the other, um, you know, nonprofits. And then we have that motel behind it that you can see there. This is a different directions of that vacant piece. So it's, it's kind of really a key. It's at Tarpon Avenue. It's on the Golden Crescent, right in the center of things. You know, and what should it be? Part of the thing right now that's going on is that this, is, this motel has been somewhat of a headache. And it's been a serious headache for the city uh, recently. And so a big problem, you know, part of the design issue is how do you design with this, this motel as part of the project. 
um, or as a backdrop to your project, or do you just wait until something happens and it, 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 it turns around? Uh, this is kind of just a quick site plan that happened just to show you the, the uh, this is Tarpon Avenue, this is the waterfront uh, along here, this is the motel in the back. The parking needs to be away from the, so we make it more walkable. The parking is hidden on the back side, and that we keep this as a pedestrian, um, pedestrian walkway all the way around, and we try to get things that interact with porches and decks and things that sit on. Hopefully, there would be public uh, place that will draw people, connect the downtown to the waterfront. So, anyway, it could be you know three or four stories. Uh, just happened to show it. It's three. Uh, multi-purpose building um, and get in, it gets back to the question, well, okay, what are we going to do now? And so this is like some things that happen in Jacksonville. Again, just little little vignettes of things. You do this, you know, the, the little charming little characters of things, uh, older buildings that are new uh, buildings on Jacksonville Beach, uh, different styles that, you know, maybe have a historical character that are new, or do you break away and be uh, be something more contemporary. Uh, so these are just a, a variety of, of, of buildings. This one is, I think, kind of a, a charming thing for that type of a setting in terms of it being shingle style, the porches, the scale. It's really, I think, about when you do new buildings, it's about the scale and the textures and, and the, the invitation, the way you want to engage in the building. So, so it kind of comes to uh, the, the question, which is what we'll be talking about Actually, John and Stephanie are going to answer it. That's that's what I'm that's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> See, I'm trying to get some free architectural advice out of all this deal. And um, so, but I mean, do you? The question is, do you uh, do you try to replicate the old building, or do you break away and say, no, it's 2020, and we need to be honest to a new style? Is is good architecture? Was it good architecture in 1910? What is good architecture in, in 2020? And is it honest to try to reenact the a building that's 100 year old, or do you break something into yourself? So 100 years from now, when they're walking around and they're saying, "Well, this is, you know, this is the mansard roof, the French influence, blah blah blah," you know, the history of this back in 2000 and, and 1910 or whatever. And then, you know, this, this guy Hoffman came up with this crazy thing here, but everybody still loves it, you know, or they all hate it, or they whatever, but does it have a place in history, you know? So a lot of people, again, I think they take history and they say, we draw the line and the character and the nature of that building at, you know, it needs to be this style, Victorian style, or, uh, you know, Roman revival, or blah, 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 Greek revival, whatever. But is it fair to say that this is, that we uh, own and deserve our own time in history? So with that, I'm done. Okay. Uh, my clock quit, so I don't know why. Good work. Thank you. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest here for a moment that we have a new component of Shakespeare, and that's to love or not to love Ed Hoffman. Okay, and uh, I'll let you thinking about his last slide and introduce the word context, because context is always a part of this discussion. Okay, um, that was good. Our next speaker is Stephanie Farrell, F-A-I-A. Stephanie's uh, career in, in redevelopment, historic preservation, architecture, and urban design spans over 34 years. Uh, she was a director of the historic Tampa Hillsborough County Preservation Board, Florida Department of State from 1980 to 1997, during which time her office provided historic preservation services to the local community as well as to the local governments. Since opening her own office in 1997, her principal goal has been to develop, to, to redevelop urban areas in a manner that encouraged both redevelopment as well as preservation of significant historic properties. I could go on quite here, but I think we're anxious to hear um, what Stephanie has to say. Stephanie Farrell. Thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you, and it is a very interesting question. <laughs> I'll say the, the, 
the lead into that is I got involved in historic preservation, the historic preservation aspect of, uh, of architecture um, when I, I was first interested in it, I would say, when I visited Europe and I saw, I observed the layering of time. That is, historic buildings from the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and then at that time the most, the, the brand newest buildings that one could see. And, and so architecture is, is, is uh, time uh, displayed physically. And um, I'm going to show you some examples where uh, the more cautious or conservative approach where there is reference to historic buildings that is, um, uh, that, that, that is, it's hard sometimes to even discern the difference between a historic building and, uh, and a new construction. And then uh, other examples, a few examples that show some uh, buildings that are uh, a far departure and, and a few things in between. So let's see. This is the, this is the right one, right? <laughs> okay, whoops, that's fast. So, um, so the, 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 the field of historic preservation uses the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. Those are 10 standards that outline, that guide rehabilitation and new construction. Only uh, standard number nine uh, really addresses historic pre new construction in the co context of historic buildings and historic districts. And, uh, and it stand that standard says that new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massive size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property or historic district and its environment. So that has a lot of room, for, leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And over the years, um, I have observed that uh, that, 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 that the, how people define that has actually gotten, has become more narrow than, than, than less so. Um, and uh, let's see, so, so why, do, why do people use this standard? Um, it is the typical standard that most, that many, and maybe even most architectural review boards for historic, historic districts use as the basis of their local design guidelines. It's also the basis of, of, for applying for certain financial incentives so, so that all new construction and as well as, as rehabilitation has to some, in some way meet those standards. Um, so I have seen two main approaches, and one of them is reference to historic features and often replication of historic features on the new construction, and with very subtle differentiation between the existing contributing buildings in a district and the proposed new buildings, or, and or, which is usually the or, stronger di differentiation of the new construction from the contributing structure structures in the district while maintaining compatibility of scale setback and massing with the historic uh, of the historic context often resulting often resulting in a more contemporary contemporary approach to that uh, his standard number nine of the secretary of the interior standards so this is a project that I worked on in, uh, in, in Tampa we will I will show a, f a few slides of Ybor City as well but I do work around the state actually little bit here and there out of the state. Um, but this one is one of my most satisfying uh, projects of recent times. And I was the historic preservation consulting architect on uh, what was a courthouse built in 19, completed in 1905. Next to it is the Sacred Heart Church, uh, finished in that same, uh, same year in downtown Tampa. The building had been vacant for 10 years. The city acquired it from, uh, uh, through, uh, GSA, Government Services Administration, and um, as a surplus property, and uh, the current mayor, Mayor Buckman, uh, uh, put out a request for proposals to turn it into this vacant uh, building into a hotel and received um, uh, five responses, and I was on the team that was selected to, uh, to, to basically work on this uh, conversion or adaptive use. So why am I talking about new construction? Well, the building was not built in the days when, when handicapped accessible or ADA uh, accessibility was a requirement. So you entered the building on the main floor 
uh, at, the, at the sec at what we call the second level, it was called the it was actually called the first level, and the ground level, which is at grade, was called the basement. So, how do you accommodate the you know new codes in an old building? So, part of that is you have to provide accessibility, and also you have to provide baggage handling capacity for a hotel use. This is now 130 hotel rooms. So again, this is the main stairway up, you know, grand staircase, wonderful. I drive by there almost every day and very often there's a wedding party. There are people having their pictures taken on the steps. It's just an amazing, it's an, an amazing venue. But what else do they need to do? This, so the, 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 the photo on the top left shows a new canopy, a new contemporary modern canopy that provides, uh, that helps provide that access to hotel guests and their baggage as well as people in wheelchairs and, 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 and so forth. So that is a very modern, clean, subtle, uh, understated approach to new construction added to an existing National Register listed, listed building. That same principle applies in historic districts as well when you look at bu new buildings in, the, in it, but it's modern. It's not pretending to have built, been built in 1905. It was completed in 2014. Um, and then the pool in the back is behind a walled area that was for some time a sally port uh, for the judges that, uh, that used this facility. And so the, 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 we, we, the developer kept the wall and was able to provide a lap to pool in that. Now that is not seen by the public, but it is a very modern interpretation of a pool. You would not guess that that would have been built in 1905. It's very clear that it's modern, but it's subtle and careful. Now, it's not in the front yard, it's in the backyard. Um, and then I would, I would just mention the National Park Service standards. If you all want to look, look up the standards and, and read more about it, I'm not going to read all that to you today, but it, it, it does exist. So that's actually, that's the bulk of the guidance that is given to one when, when one is doing uh, a project like this. So we're, we are going to talk a little bit about Ymore City, and I'd like to just mention I worked on the, not the first historic district there, but the later two. Um, the the uh, red boundary is the boundaries of the National Historic Landmark District. The National Park Service worked with my office, actually. they In that case, they prepared uh, the documentation necessary for it to become a National Historic Landmark District, a very special uh, category. And then uh, the green boundary is the local historic district. And for years, I was the administrator of that, uh, of, the, of the design review board called the Barrio Latino Commission um, for that area. And, uh, and, and as was mentioned, uh, I've been in private practice. I, I love that time period, but I most enjoy right now the time period of, of helping developers uh, rehabilitate historic buildings and sometimes do new construction. So, um, I mentioned the first uh, one already, I won't say that again, except to say we are going to see some examples of referential uh, new construction. And this is a typical street on the south end of the historic district, and you'll see those are the cigar workers' cottages that exist um, in, I guess that's, that's Fifth Avenue, I believe, uh, uh, just south of Seventh Avenue, which is the main drag, we'll, we'll see an image or two of that as well. And then uh, this is part of that context. There were neighborhood grocery stores. That is a building that, that, that dates from the, uh, the teens. And then in the background, you'll see some newer structures. And, whoops. Uh, and those, the, this, these are three new multifamily residential buildings that, are, that pay strong uh, homage to the original characteristics of the building, such as gable roofs, uh, traditional columns, picket, uh, you know, standard picket style uh, fences, uh, traditionally, traditional appearance, appearing uh, balustrades, windows that, you know, that date from, that, uh, that appear to date from the time. Yes? That is new. So it is definitely referring to the past. Now it's a little larger than those smaller bungalows that we saw, the, the uh, cigar workers' cottages, but it's it's, it's in scale with some of the larger buildings in that in the south end of Ebor. Um, so those are those are new. So that is one approach. It's a valid approach. And uh, when I consult with people who are 
doing, proposing to do new construction in the historic district. I know that the Bar Barrio Latino Commission Board uh, leans towards that approach, so obviously I will, I will advise my clients accordingly. Even though I might have a preference for something that's a little bolder personally, uh, obviously I have to serve, serve my clients and, and, and get them uh, through the process. Um, so this is um, a par portion of, of 7th Avenue. I happen to be working on the, the right-hand building as well, which looks pretty bad. That picture was, that, that photo was taken yesterday. But that one is under, it's, it's being rehabilitated. It'll be a combination of uh, commercial on the ground floor, and then there, there will be a, an addition uh, uh, set back from the front of, uh, behind it. And we'll, we will see an image of what's proposed uh, behind it as well. So in the, in the background on the right, you'll see a building that was designed by Walt Chancy. It is a new building, um, and it was, it was uh, constructed at least 10 years ago when the Barrio Latino Commission was a little less cautious about new construction and design. So it is obviously clearly new, referential to some of the industrial style vernacular that is in vocabulary that's part of, of Ebor's history. On the, on the left is... Um, the Hampton Inn, which is a project that you worked on. Did you work on that, Ed? No, you didn't. Okay, well, then, anyway, so there, that is another new building that's sort of a blend. It's a little bit more modern uh, than, than a true referential building, uh, but not as modern as Walt Chancy's white uh, uh, four-story built office building uh, on the right. And then, uh, you know, we all deal, or at least many of us deal with how do you, how do you, how do you, uh, approach new design when, when a, a major company such as McDonald's or Burger King, et cetera, wants to build a new, a new structure in a historic district. Well, this one is right near the interstate on the north end of the historic district. And I, I would say uh, if I were giving it a grade, I'd give it a C plus, maybe a B minus. I mean, it's, it, it, it does a decent job. It's, it is real brick. Um, it is real painted steel. Um, and, it, and, and there is some attempt at architectural detail, although it's, it's, there's not a lot of finesse to it. But I, I would say, I guess ultimately, that it probably meets the standards. It's just not, a, it's not a, a, you know, my, my, the best example. But it is an example, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge to a board, because you wind up, if you're uh, on a historic uh, preservation review board, you, you know, you're not the designer. So you try to pull out of the client and, and their architect the best that can be uh, made from the, from the opportunity and, and meet the standards, and, and that, that's, what, that's what happened then. So we're going to move on way, uh, well, we're going to move on to this. This is a fire station that I'm also working on. I'm a consult, consulting architect. Cooper, Johnson, Smith are the architects on this and the addition next door. This was a firehouse that was stuccoed um, in, the 18, in the 1980s and, and became an office building. And uh, this is the way the building stands to, today. Uh, the stucco on the front facade has been removed. And then you'll see that the, uh, this, based on historic documentation, that the facade is going to be recreated on the fire station, which is the leftmost building, obviously. And uh, it will be, uh, I guess, I think it will continue to be office, built, office space, although there was a rear addition to it that might be a residential. Now, the two buildings, the, what appears to be the two buildings on the right um, is, a, is an apartment building, will be apartment buildings, and it is somewhat, they are both, well, actually, it is only one building. It's articulated to look like two buildings so that it, it's to, in order to try to meet the massing and scale of the district, it breaks up what would be a very large facade into you know, s smaller pieces. And uh, it has balconies, which are you know, referential. It's got a st you know, st stepped parapets, which are all also refer to the past. Now, in looking at it, you would say, for sure, that's a new, that when, you, when it is built, you for, you for sure, sure will know that it's new construction. It'll have modern storefronts on the ground floors and so forth, but it is, not, it is definitely uh, sort of a re referential approach. It is a more conservative uh, approach to meeting the standards, and it does meet the standards. It's right behind that the building that, we, that I mentioned to you that was under, under rehab, the Kadresha building. Um, so, so, and then right next to it is, is Marti Park, which the uh, owners are, are assisting on as well. 
So that's, this is, I, I think it's appropriate, is it, it and, and it will be, I, I expect it will be financially successful. I, I'm sure that, that the, uh, the people will love to live there and, uh, and it meets the standards. Now, uh, I told you I was going to go a little further afield and I, I one of my favorite places to travel uh, is, is, is Denver and I, whenever I travel, I photograph. Uh, sometimes it's flowers, very seldom it's people, but always it's buildings. And um, so lower downtown Denver is, includes a historic district. It's not all a historic district, but it is definitely, uh, uh, anyway, so that's the context of, you know, large buildings such as Union Station, which is now, which it has been rehabbed and is being used. used. Uh, these, are these are historic buildings that continue to exist and, and are, uh, are used. And then um, this is some of the new construction in Denver, which is a strong, I'm almost done, strong departure from the, you can see the historic district, historic building in the background, this uh, six story building in the middle, and then the building on the right is actually a single family dwelling. Oh, there it is again on the, on the left. That's owned by a, phys a Denver physician. I don't know him. And then right next to it is a little brick building uh, that is historic. So this is the this is the this is the, the you know this is a building that I think is quite beautiful. Does it meet their standards as interpreted by them at the time? Yes. And uh, but it, something like that would probably be difficult to get through the for instance the Barrio Latino Commission. I would say uh, highly unlikely. Another example of infill. And then uh, this is right at the, this is not in the historic district, but it's at the edge of the historic historic district. This is my last formal slide, and you'll see that's Coors, Coors, Coors Field. It's wrapped by modern brick building, by brick structures that are trying to scale the size of that large structure down to be compatible with the historic buildings that are nearby. And then uh, once you step back from that brick used facade, I mean, it's not just a facade, it's actually useful space, then you, then you step back into the uh, the actual stadium uh, for the field. Um, so, oh, and this is this is my last slide, which also demonstrates the concept, which is this is the main lobby of the federal courthouse, and you'll see it's got there are none of the original lighting fixtures were there. There is quite a bit of latitude for modern contemporary fixtures, modern furniture. Um, in, in, while retaining the historic fabric of the original uh, terrazzo and, and uh, marble floors, uh, 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 way, uh, wall finishes and wainscoting, the original plaster ceilings have been uh, carefully restored, and uh, so all of the original fabric is there, but then you layer the time, you know that, that, that it is today, it's not pretending to be 1905, um, it's a building that's put to use for today's needs and, and, um, and is successful in many ways. So that's it. I'm not going to go into a big biography uh, in the interest of time except to say that uh, I lived, worked, and practiced architecture in New York uh, City for 20 years, lived and worked in Manhattan, was a partner at a large firm there, a junior partner, which means that you approach life differently uh, from the standpoint of your career. And maybe uh, you never get the chance to buy out your senior partners who probably should have been bought out, but that's life as an architect. So you go on and do other things. Fast forward to uh, Florida. I arrived here in uh, 2011, and in the search for Florida, uh, it came about when uh, my company opened an office in Miami in 1987, and then we wound up doing some work in Longboat Key and other places, and it was when I discovered um, the West Coast. Um, when my wife and I made the decision to come down here, um, we were looking for um, the kind of lifestyle that one can find in New York City, but at a smaller scale. And ultimately, after looking at places like Dunedin um, and uh, Clearwater and St. Petersburg, we discovered 
um, what a charming place St. Petersburg is because it has the mix of the traditional neighborhoods and with it all of the amenities that you can find in cities. Great museums, a fabulous art scene, um, restaurants, and there is always something going on in downtown St. Petersburg on the weekend. The problem that we have is very simple, and that is protecting our traditional residential neighborhoods. Now, this is not unique to St. Petersburg. It's going on in Casa Grill in, uh, uh, in St. Pete Beach, all over Pinellas County. Um, it's going on, in fact, I'm going to be consulting over in, in uh, November in Palm Beach, in, north, in the north end of Palm Beach, they've got the same kind of problem. And that is the title of this presentation. It is the intrusion of the big box on traditional residential neighborhoods. Now, what do I mean by traditional residential neighborhoods? Well, Old Northeast and Kenwood are on the National Register of Historic Places. You know what that designation is? It's worthless. It's a frickin' plaque. That's all it is, because any structure in there, unless it is designated as an individual landmark, can be torn down tomorrow. And here's what's going on, okay? First of all, we have known about houses for a long time. These are some sketches from a fellow named Leon Cryer, who's a new urbanist, and he looks at the house in the, in the way that we understand it traditionally until about 1930, when it took on a totally different form. We've come back now to more traditional terms in this century, and that is interesting because what we've experienced is that we, we call this a house, some architects call that a house. We call this a window, some owners call that a window. We call that a door, some people call that a door, and so on. That's the problem that we're dealing with. Here's the context that I referred to earlier. The house on the left, oops, pardon me, the house on the left and the house on the right are one-story traditional houses a block from where I live in St. Petersburg. They are of modest architectural value, but that's not the point in the discussion. This is a house that is, being, that is under construction adjacent to those two houses and look at what you're experiencing. The second floor porch is higher than the roof of either of its neighbors. The architecture is simply non-existent. That's an elevation of that house and, and there's no more decoration to it. It's white stucco. There is a picture in context of what you see next to it. Some folks renovated that house and did a pretty decent job of it and look what's towering next to it. Here's another one few blocks away from where I live. The building on the right is a 100-year-old craftsman house. It is occupied, it is well-maintained, it is a wonderful place, and these people just about every year sponsor a porch party in our neighborhood to invite people in and share with them the experience of that house. Next to it is a house that is currently under construction and every day I pass by it, it gets worse. But look at it, there is absolutely no interest in this design in, of anything to do with the house adjacent to it. So these are two sort of glaring examples, what I call the poster children of the problem of the intrusion of the box. So here we go, how best to control size and bulk. And this is what we've been dealing with in the city of St. Petersburg for the last year and a half. You can have individual landmark designation. That means that some individual or a couple who owns a property steps forward and says, I want to protect this house in perpetuity and I'm gonna seek that designation. There's a process for it, you file with the city. Generally speaking, the city will grant it without much fuss because that's a voluntary effort on the part of the individual property owners. You can establish historic districts. The problem is, and we've experienced this, in St. Petersburg, in Old Northeast, and in Kenwood and other neighborhoods is they are so large and the rules by which you have to, or that you, that you have to go through and the steps to get a designation of a large block like that takes forever and a day if you can get it done because of the voting rules, one thing or another, and I don't have time to go into the details. So what is happening now in St. Petersburg is individual blocks are getting together. So the 700 block of 18th Avenue, which is five houses on each side of the street, 10 houses total, those 10 homeowners got together, petitioned the city to designate their block as a local historic district. 
It's a way to attack the problem of preservation in these districts at a manageable scale, because the chances are that you can get eight or 10 or whatever of these folks to agree that their block is worthy of that. That has now, um, it, it's become sort of our local craft beer industry because other neighborhoods now are trying to do the same thing where they want to protect their neighborhoods. Design guidelines for historic districts is another tool, okay? Uh, in St. Petersburg, we just adopted earlier this year a pattern book for traditional neighborhoods, which outlines very specifically all of the styles that we found and inventoried within the city limits, puts them in a book and said, okay, if you are going to modify one of these houses, here's the handbook about how to do it. Oh, by the way, you have to follow the handbook. We also put in the, in the uh, land development regulations a, a, a statement that says, if you are in a historic district, you must look at this book if you plan to build one of those new structures adjacent to other neighborhoods. You've got to look at the context. You have the form-based code. That's a whole different undertaking, and, and uh, Ed alluded to it very briefly, the smart code, same thing. I don't have time to discuss that. What we wound up with in St. Petersburg, because we couldn't make the leap to the form-based code, is to modify or tailor modifications to our land development regulation, what many of you may perhaps know as the, as the local zoning ordinance. Very briefly, what a form-based code does is it sets out standards for building form, it sets out standards for public spaces, and it has a regulating plan for a specified area within the city uh, or specific neighborhoods. Probably the most important thing that you have to address here is floor area ratio. You have to establish some size limitations on the new development. And what we discovered is that that tool is widely used throughout the United States and Florida to limit the size of construction is in residential neighborhoods. And we found that um, a 0.7 is at the high end, but it seems that, that that's a justification. The problem is 0.7 is way too big in most cases in and of itself. And so what we did is we took a different approach and said we're going to start lower and end at the bigger number because we want to encourage development, but we want it done in some way that is, recognizes the context. Gross floor area basically is you count up all the area that is air conditioned, that's the simplest way to describe it. A covered porch that's outside, not enclosed, doesn't count in that. And in residential neighborhoods, you want the garage included in that, uh, in that count. So in St. Petersburg, what we discovered is, is that we had um, a bunch of new homes built over time, and in the last four years that we surveyed, 2014 through 2016, there were 496 houses built. We looked at the average, I keep hitting the wrong button here, uh, the, the average looked uh, in these areas in our, in our zoning districts was actually 0.3, it was very low. And these houses I showed you, those first two slides were at 0.5 and 0.8, very large. So we said, okay, well, how do we make that case? We looked at the newer homes and we found that the total FAR, the average FAR, I should say, is about 0.44. What we were trying to do is build a case for the lower end to start low and then allow growth with additional floor area in a way that, that is inspired by incentives. And that's where I'm going with this, okay? Let's get by that one. So the city came out with this draft and said they wanted a base FAR of 0.5, bonus system of 0.2 for a total 0.7. And we simply asked the question, okay, of the 266 houses built in 2015 and 2016, if the FAR, only 13 of those exceeded 0.6, why are you going to 0.7? without some logic and reason behind it. And what we got to is, and I'll skip by this one in the interest of time, this one as well, is we got to an incentive bonus system. We said we're gonna start with a low FAR as a base, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you bonuses that will get you to 0.7 if you do certain things. And some of those choices include reducing the size of the second floor, reducing the floor to floor height, because the, those first buildings I showed you, the floor to floor height, the floor to ceiling height is 12 feet in, these, in this new construction. Um, the, other, the other issues are dormers, uh, eaves parallel to the street, if you turn the eaves parallel to the street, not that we don't want dormers facing the street, 
and finally a usable front porch that had to be a minimum of six feet deep. Most of these porches in these new houses, you can put one lawn chair out there and that's about it. Maybe a small table next to it. So those are the kinds of things that we decided that we need to do to bring some sense to it. Now, you, what you notice in here is that there is no style. We're not saying that you dictate style. We're simply saying that you use these tools to bring architecture back to the equation. And then finally, we made the argument with the city that one size doesn't fit all. An NT1 neighborhood, neighborhood traditional one versus a neighborhood traditional four is different because the, the makeup of the houses in that district are different. A neighborhood suburban is different. And they bought that argument that one size does not fit all. So that's a very condensed version of it. What we'd like to do now, we have to be out of this room by, a little bit, by about 5 o'clock, 5.05. It's 10 minutes of 5. So what I'd like to do now is rather than sit over here because we've got a problem with the microphone, can I move this? Oh, I can. Okay. So let's open the floor to questions. You can direct a question to any one of the panelists, to Ed or Stephanie, myself, on any subject that we talked about here, and we'll be happy to answer it. So a question there, Chris. Um, when, you're, when you're bringing up about scale of buildings right now, how do you, is there some way as architects you could help people um, uh, approach the fact of the floodplain being so high around our area, a lot of the homes are, are not even permitted to build unless they're above 12 feet, so they wouldn't even consider that bottom floor being part of their home. And, and so that, let's change the shape of, you know, uh, what is the shape of a home now when you've got to begin at 12 feet high? Well, you, you've picked the most unique problem to deal with, and it's also the most difficult because you're forced to build. Oh, no, it's, well, we have it plenty around St. Petersburg. So what you have to do, it, it still, you can still apply those incentives. They're just lifted off the, off the ground 12 feet. Anybody else? Yeah. Say the design of it definitely is going to be difficult. I mean, part of it you could maybe achieve with with doing some, you know, some fill and and um, and so forth. But you know, obviously your front door, your your front, the entrance to your main level is going to be, you know, way above your next door neighbors. Um, I don't, I don't. It is not an easy. There's not an easy answer to the to the you know, to, to making a design that is compatible. And I know that as you know, we as we see global warming, regardless of its cause, we're going to have more. We're going to have to respond to that on a, on a practical level as well as a code level. Uh, I think FEMA is looking at it as all of those low houses need to be gone. At some some point or other, they need to be elevated or be gone. So that's where they're driving to in terms of not being able to remodel. Yeah, you can, yeah. If a bill, if a property is listed in the National Register of Historic Places, you can get an exemption. Um, I've worked on a, a, a couple projects in Naples where you can get an exemption for rehabilitation, although not for new construction. Yeah, there's a little house for Ann Clark that was on her family property out off Keystone, and now that's been put out. Um, my brother worked on it. It was in, it's built up, uh, but it has this base, big base planter around it and then this cute little house sitting on top of it, which actually is scaled pretty nicely. Um, that's one way to get around it. But. The, you need a talented architect for sure. And the other piece of it is the box that I showed you, think of that 12 feet higher in the air. So it makes the idea of manipulating that box and, and manipulating the form and changing it, forcing it away from a box, all the more important. Anyone else? That's it? Okay. Um, all right. Well, we're out of here. I was going to ask Chris to uh, uh, give a short presentation, but um, we, I don't think we have time for that. Uh, there is another event in this room, so uh, we do have to vacate it, and it's going to take us a while. So, Phyllis, do you have something? Okay, Stafford House is open. Are there refreshments? Uh, we still, well, actually, we pretty well taken them down today, but um, we have all the water and milk. Okay. Well, we have all the water and cookies. Okay, so bottled water and cookies so you can get your dinner off on the right foot, right?
Thank you, everybody. Um, if anyone, if anyone has a suggestion for a topic or topics or location for our next summit, which we would schedule for either April or May of 2018, uh, by all means, communicate with me or with Chris Moore on staff. We'd be happy to entertain your ideas. Thank you again.